Alright, g'day. Welcome back to Head Angle Podcast. Um, stoked to be sitting here with Matt Holmes again. How you doing? Welcome back for the Head Angle number four. Yeah, we're pumped. Been a minute. So, Alright, well, tonight we're pretty stoked. We've got a pretty amazing dude with us. Um, basically, the voice of good times and BMX in this fair city. The man, the myth, the legend, the Xavier Cohen. Fuck How you hell. doing? Oh, I'm pretty... Yeah, pretty flattered by that thanks very much yeah no I'm doing well thanks um thanks for very much for having me this fucking this is pretty sweet I'm really looking forward to getting to talk to you guys uh with some massive microphones in front of our faces for once <laughs> it's Ginormous gonna be good yeah yeah I'm looking forward to it oh yeah man well, yeah. man we've I don't know all of us we've known each other for a long time now and it's you know we've definitely shared a lot of uh yeah rad rad times a lot of bike riding just Cool shit, man. So that's um, fuck load of bike riding. That's, that's for sure. Let's delve. Let's delve deep. Um, nice. I don't know if you want to. Let's go back to the beginning of young Zave growing up in the Blue Mountains. Fuck yeah. How'd you kind of start riding bikes, man? Uh, I kind of a kind of out of necessity, like growing up and needing needing a bike or whatever to get around town. You know, like to go go up the shop and get milk and whatever that type of thing. Like starts you riding bikes, and then. I was lucky enough that like around my town, there just happened to be the worst BMX track in like all of New South Wales. I think it got <laughs> voted that like five or six years in a row, but. Who uh, votes for this stuff? <laughs> I don't fucking know, but that's what we got told. They. Yeah, they, yeah, they the, the, the upper echelon dudes, I suppose. Um, uh, and so I used to go down there and sort of hang out and then I'd, I'd slowly, that was where I learned to ride a bike as well, actually, like rolling down a fucking old school rolling hill. Like it wasn't like a crazy one they have now, obviously, but you guys know that <laughs> pretty Which well. Which track is this? Lawson. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and so kind of like learn how to ride down there and kicking around or whatever. And, and it wasn't for like a little bit longer. I guess I was like fairly young when I noticed that they were doing races down there, that there were a whole bunch of people getting together and having races and I had no idea that there was like a formal thing or a club or any, any you know, anything like that. But I, I just thought it was cool. And I was like, yeah, that, whatever it is those dudes are doing is cool. And I enjoyed that. And then I found out that my two cousins, um, Roger and Mark Vaughan, who are like as OG as they fucking come, they're from Mittagong area and they used to build these jumps, like, like modern style jumps, but way back in the fucking mid nineties, you know, like these jumps still had square, Square fucking edges and all the rest of it, you know. There were like, a few sets of trails in Mittagong back then. That I remember was going them. to some early when I was. Were young. they were they the ones up near the tip? Yeah, tip trails. Yeah, and there that were ones was at Mark the and Roger Weir as well. That was both of those sets no were way. Mark and Roger Vaughan, my cousins. Yeah, fucking hell. So they they were the guys that kind of like. Yes. I guess I saw like a bike with pegs and four piece bars and all that shit that really fucking turns you on, you know, like the stuff that like is like fuck that's mechanical and oh my god, and then to see the dudes like. They were like ro they strapping through the fucking bush at those tip jumps, you know, like just flat, like a flat fucking plane. And then the jumps are just sort of built out of the ground, like pretty old school style, but pretty modern as well. Anyway, strapping through there and then just like launching. And I was just like, what the fuck is going on? Like, where is he? Where is he going to? And yeah. then like landing over there, like, what the fuck just happened? Like he went from <laughs> fucking there to there and there's nothing in between, like... All I'd seen was the BMX track, you know, like everything's like you make it or whatever the fuck you don't, you know, whatever. You either make it or you, you don't. No, there's no repercussions. Yeah. These dudes jump and jumps that were like built out of the ground with fucking nothing in the middle and they knew that they were going to land that. I was like, how the fuck does this, how the fuck do you guys work that out? That that is something that you can do. And that just got me like just absolutely enamored with it. Like I just fucking fell in love and I, I yeah, just spent the fucking probably next... I don't know, fucking long time of my life trying to like have a bike that was even similar to theirs, you know, like something that looked heavy, that looked solid, that looked <laughs> mechanical, that looked fucking like it could take a beating and shit. And um, yeah, I never ended up getting one of those types of bikes as a kid, but, <laughs> but it kept me fucking hunting, you know, like I really, I, I loved it. I fell in love with it. Then. Do you remember, what was the first bike you remember having like in riding at the track and stuff? Uh, I, well, I do remember having a 16 inch bike that was pretty sick, um, that I liked cause I, I do no footers <laughs> on it for some reason. Like I was pretty fucking young, but, um, um, 
I don't mean I was like young for doing that trick, but I mean like young for having a memory of a bike that I've psyched on. But the grips were like those molded hard plastic grips that were molded to the shape of little kids' hands. With the weird winged flangey bits. Exactly, hands. yeah. Oh. They would like wrap up over the edge of your oh, pinky yeah. and shit. That's the Oakley B wing grip or whatever. Truly. That was. Yeah, but the, the Kmart version was made yeah, of yeah. solid hard plastic. It was made right, of right. Yeah. Well, yeah. That, I had a bike that had those concrete. on there, like crazy sweep on the bars and shit like that. And around that time, the older guys who were racing like the Wales brothers and um, fucking the Douglas brothers and shit like that, like Chook and all these guys that are, if you're from the fucking mountains, like these dudes are legends. All those dudes were like riding and um, doing whatever. And I had this fucking like, was it? Yeah, this like real shitty fucking 16 inch bike. But these guys had like pit bikes. They started bringing like their own 16 inches down to the, to the, fucking bmx track or whatever and having fun on them and just buggerizing around but that's when i noticed oh my god you can swap components on these bikes as well you know like you can take i can take this little fucking thing off here and put that one you know like i could change the stems over or the goosenecks or whatever the fuck it was i could change that shit around so i started bike. exactly i started building a 16 inch bike with like like <laughs> not good parts at all but better parts than what were on them rather than having like a Phillips head screwdriver <laughs> gooseneck piece that was attached to like a one piece handlebar. I, I fucked that off and put in like a one inch gooseneck that had like those terrible 13 millimeter <laughs> bolts. Underneath bolts yeah, the underneath bolts. bolts that was yeah, like, it was, a, it was like a circle inside a circle that was somehow meant to grip Gripping, on enough. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. So that was the shit I was like, you know started what I'm tripping about the most? What? You want a 16 inch bike. Yeah, man, I know, right? <laughs> You're seven foot. The man <laughs> child. Girth of man. Yeah, yeah. As, uh, <laughs> but yeah, that bike, I, I ran that bike for a long time. I was psyched on that. And then um, the, the first bike I remember getting that I that was new that had uh, that I was like fucking blown away by was this piece of shit Repco bike that mum bought from fucking God knows where. But it was brand new. It had the little hairs on the tires. And I remember staring at the hairs on the tires for so fucking long, like getting that bike on Christmas day, it was like out the back of the house, you know, it was like fully magical fucking times getting this bike. I wasn't expecting. Um, and yeah, staring at like the newness of the tires with their hairs all over it. Like I just, the textural fucking you smell of the rubber and night? shit. Yeah, definitely. I what, like I, I'm sure I would have, but ever, ever since then, like those smells, I can fucking smell it now, but the smell of the rubber tires, like that brand new rubber smell is fucking just burned into my brain. And yeah, I really like that. The, that bike was sick. That was a Repco. But that was pretty, you know, that was cool for a while. And then like, and then styles changed again. And I was like, I got to be a little bit older. And uh, so I had to get something new, like Chrome. I had to have Chrome something, like something Chrome didn't, had. Didn't we all, man? Man, it was fucking <laughs> it was... like, I had to have that shit. Otherwise, like I was going to kill myself or, you know, I was going to kill everyone else or something. <laughs> Mum knew that. So she went out and got a $20 free agent eluder. That had no brakes and had a crack in the crossbar of the handlebars. <laughs> no grips on it. $20 and gave it to me. That was my birthday present when I was like 12 or something. But that was that was enough. That was like a proper 20-inch bike that had like 20-inch wheels, had a fucking freewheel. It was 4416 and shit, you know, with those wafer thin sprockets and one-piece oh, yeah. cranks and shit. And dropouts. What's that? And dropouts. It had dropouts, talk, yeah. No, talk about wafer thin. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, they were like pathetic. Um <laughs> <laughs> but like, yeah, like, you know, three eights, just piece of shit, old free agent. Like, brakeless, yeah. Nothing's fucking changed. Yeah, it's, it's brakeless. Um, v brake mounts. And there was no fucking way I knew how to set up V brake mounts, let alone get my hands on a pair of V brakes. So, um, so, what year are we talking that you've run brakeless since then, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Well, before then, no, because I, I took the wedges out of my 16 inch back wheel, so I didn't have back pedal brakes on that. So, you had a standard. Uh Unbreak. An unbreak. I guess. Yeah. I don't know. I, I took the. I heard you could do that with backpedal brakes, and I wanted yep. to be like the old kids yep. with um, and not have to not have backpedal brakes. So I took. I heard you could do that, so I did it, that's, and then it was that's like some good stuff. I think I lost a few of the ball bearings in the mm. process, yeah. so it was pretty fucking rough ride after yeah. that for a while. But yeah. um, no, it was good. Like that. Yeah, that was cool. Is that like I, an OG street or free? Oh, you know, flatland dude. Uh, yeah, totally. That's exactly what I've been doing. <laughs> you know, flatland for 40 years. <laughs> I'm did you, guru of the shit. Did you um, ever try racing out? Yeah, I did. I, track I, I fucking awesome. did. Yeah, I I, uh, I tried racing on my free agent Aluda with no brakes and everything. And I went I went down there like I heard it was um, 
because I like because I was riding at this track constantly. I was like I was pretty fast and I was really enjoying the track and I knew the track inside and out. And I was scared of this dude. I was probably like straight. No, like no. Anyway, (laughs) (laughs) no other way. Um, Yeah, and I went down and um, tried to sign up, thinking like you know maybe maybe i'll go okay maybe i'll see how it goes or whatever and they basically snubbed me and they were like who the fuck do you think you are like you pathetic poor motherfucker like i had heard it was five dollars to sign up and they're like it's five dollars to ride in the open day dipshit and like it's 25 dollars if you want to sign up for the year or whatever and you have to have a long sleeve shirt and you have to have gloves and you have to have a fucking helmet and, and you have to have brakes on your bike <laughs> and i was like Fuck, like the only helmet I had was this piece of shit Rosebank helmet that would have got me bullied down hard. Like this is fucking Dude, everyone had a stack hat, man. Dude, I was, I didn't even have a fucking stack hat. Like I had a piece of shit. I was in an ad for Rosebank stack hats, dude. God damn it, man. So you're the one that my fucking mum probably saw and was like, he looks smart and intelligent. I'm going to go and (laughs) fucking buy it. I think that's what they said in the ad, dude. (laughs) Blame this guy. I'm going to buy the helmet that man's wearing. That'll keep my son safe. So yeah, I went down and um, anyway, so they told me I had to do all that shit. So I went back home, sorted out some, um, I don't know, what fucking glo- gardening gloves or something like that. Because my little brother started racing at the same time and he was racing in cotton gloves. And I got the gardening gloves because I was like older and shit. So I took advantage of the fact that I was older than him. And I was like, no, nah, man, I need the fucking leather gloves or whatever. But like big open fucking gardening gloves and Rosebank helmet and um all my brakes and shit had just been sticky taped on. I just sticky taped the fucking... <laughs> like the lever was on the handlebars legitimately, the cracked handlebars. Scru- it was still cracked handlebars. Um, dream. What and I put yeah. the, the cable on, like sticky taped the cable fucking housing onto the uh, lever or whatever and then around to the frame and sticky taped it to the frame and shit. Has some brake calipers on there with no pads or whatever and so there's no chance of it, you know, touching or anything like that. Whatever the fuck it was. Um, but they were just like fake brakes, like brakes at a site. You know what I mean? Like if they just glance at it, it's got brakes. As long as I don't let them fucking have a look at my bike. Pretty fucking light glance. <laughs> no, well, that's, that's the thing. Like, but if you're standing there in front of your bike with your hands on your bars, you know, like raring to go, ready to race, here's my fucking $25 or whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They look down and see the lever and a cable. Well, they're not going to assume that you fucking sticky tape this shit to your bike. And, you know? and there is a rule. Like if you're not in a shop buying a bike where you can touch all the brakes, you don't go and touch someone else's brakes and pull the lever. I mean, that's yeah, that's pretty of. much, you don't do that. I'm sure I broke that rule. <laughs> I don't think you should do that. I mean, me personally. Yeah, no, well, maybe as a fucking 10 year old, I was, maybe I didn't give a shit. But no, no, I'm talking about the scrutineer who shouldn't touch your brakes. Oh, no, absolutely yeah. not. Stay the fuck Screw away from them. me. I'm a child, pedo. Get yeah, away. Exactly. Like, I just want to race. Violation of personal space. That's it, <laughs> right? Let me fucking race. That was it. And so I raced. I raced. They put me in D group because of my age, I think it was. And I fucking smoked those fools. Like, it was undefeated in D group. Undefeated, though, uh, by a fucking mile, a country mile. And they gave me the trophy for that, bumped me to C. And I was, I think, the first race, the first day in C, we had five motos in the day. And the first fucking four motos, I was like smoked. Like these guys were blasting me. I was coming fucking sixth and fifth and shit like that and getting beaten by a couple of girls who were racing there as well, which I don't mean to be sexist, but in the late 90s, that was a bit of a hit for a 10-year-old or what, 11-year-old to take. I wonder who it was. Um, fuck, I can't remember her name, but... She, uh, they, she was incredible. She's from a racing family, and they were all just like fucking so dialed, you know, yeah. like super, super my, my, good. My all first, her. my first ever race day, I yeah. was eleven or twelve. I got beat by an eight-year-old girl. Fuck. So don't, okay. Don't yeah. Feel right. Too bad. Right. Man. Right. Yeah, well, yeah. it's probably like you know fairly <laughs> similar circumstances, I suppose. But like these guys are all up in the fucking gate wearing fucking pajamas and a helmet <laughs> and all the rest of the fucking get up and creepy shit and all the rest. And I'm like, and like with sticky taped brakes on and gardening <laughs> gloves and. I think I was wearing like fucking hiking boots that my mum had bought me or something like, for, you know, like full on big clunky fucking outdoors boots because I'm thinking like, that's what people wear when they're fucking being physical, you know, like, I'm going to ride this bicycle now. Well, one take foot off out in the, the corner, fucking... man. You want some foot protection. I didn't have to put a foot out. I was too far ahead. It didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but C Group taught me, taught me a lot. They'd fucking smash my ego the first four races and the fifth race of the day they decided it was going to be a sit down race. They, like everyone was going to sit down and no one was going to stand up. You're going to do the lap like that. Um, and everybody's looking at each other across the gate. Everybody, yeah, yeah, yeah. everybody agrees that that's what's going to happen. And as soon as the fucking gate drops, I just stand up and just fucking leg it because <laughs> fuck those cunts, right? I'm fucking going to win some shit today. Like I did not get undefeated in D grade. 
just to be bumped up to C grade to find out that I should be in D grade, yeah. right? <laughs> That's not my fucking, yeah. no way, I'm going to B today. And so I stood up and pedaled my fucking ass off and had like almost an entire straight of a head start and I still came third. <laughs> I was like, the, they fucking smoked me in that one. And after that, it was kind of like, yeah, I don't know if I fucking like this racing side of it. Like, pre preferred to spend time in the bush, you know, like that, that type of thing. But I thought that racing was the only connection to um, more more people who ride bikes, you know. And then the, and then it was kind of like discovered, yeah, that like Hazelbrook trails were there and they were a bit of a thing. And, um, you know, there were guys that were like, just like my cousins who lived, you know, Mittagong's not that far from where I live, but... As you a kid, it's away, fuck, no, it's, no, 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 fucking, no, fucking way. It's an hour and a half drive. But as a kid, that's like you know to the moon and back. So to find out that there were kids doing like similar shit to them, but like just nearby, fucking blew my mind. And that's what that's where I was kind of like, all right, fuck racing, you know. Like, so Hazo was in its prime then, basically. Yeah, Hazo was fucking crazy, man. Like we, we had been going down there and sort of looking at, at what they were doing down there since we were very young, but we knew well and truly to stay away. Like it was like fucking hardcore dudes throwing rocks at kids and Who shit. And Glenn Newland. Yeah, Glenn Newland. Yeah, yeah, fucking nice, <laughs> man. Like, Glenn, I went, yeah. It made a them giant ranger with dreadlocks. You, you gotta be careful, man. He's a fucking intimidating man. I, oh my God. Like, I've never, I don't think I've ever met somebody as intimidating One as he was when I was. Planet. Yeah, and he's fucking lovely. Like, he's <laughs> the best guy. But when you're a kid and you, you know, you fucking can hear these guys like hollering and going on in the bush just off over yonder and you can't see them. It's fucking scary. And then you have to come out of the bush and like hope they accept you, you know? Like it was very rare that anybody was accepted down there and you and fucking knew how to run a ship, you know? And like we were the young fucking dickheads that like we would walk in there with a skateboard or whatever and be like, hey, can you do it? Can you go through the jumps for my friends and me so we can watch and just get shut down by them and shit, you know? So they throw rocks at us until we left and all that type of <laughs> shit. And it was, it. <laughs> it was only through like, we started digging our own jumps um, up, up in Lawson uh, when I was like 10. Um, that was fucking sick. I was with, with a dude called Steve Brown and a dude called Andrew Beeman who were a couple of years older than me. But that was where we started digging jumps that we thought we could like potentially have something that was similar to Hazelbrook. But we knew that there was no fucking way, like we just were incapable of jumping jumps like that at that point. Um, and then we started digging, yeah, we started digging jumps and stuff. And then we thought like, these have got to get bigger. We've got to, we've got to find a way to make these bigger, but not really knowing like where the fuck are we going to get this dirt from? You know, like up until that point, jumps are just like kind of mounds of dirt that you could scrape the topsoil together. Like that was like the evolution of a 10 year old and two 12 year olds, yeah. you know, trying to build their own shit. And then I was, and then. Ah, oh, fuck. That's, it was around that time I saw my cousin's jumps and that, they had fucking tombs, dug out tombs in the ground, you know? And I was like, holy shit, that's where we get the fucking dirt from. We dig the jumps into the ground, we make them fucking twice as high. We've got dirt coming out of our fucking asses and we've got bigger jumps, you know what I mean? And so that's where we, we dug out all these pits and shit and we had like a proper eight pack or something like that. That was like all dug into the ground. It was fucking legit. And that was pretty much, that was like, that spot at the bottom of Hughes Avenue in Lawson was pretty much it. Like aside from the BMX track, that spot was like just being hooked on everything to yeah. do with, yeah. Like I, I didn't, there was no skate parks and no fucking, there was street, I guess, but like not when that did, I fucking knew about. When did Winnie Falls pop up? Like the, the bowls and... Winnie Falls started in 98. That's by, way later, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was um, that was Chris Smith and uh, another dude, I can't fucking remember his last name, but his name is Bennett and he's incredibly creative uh dude i've just said chris and bennett and i'm just like mind -boggling. yeah i know right yeah yeah but Trails? chris, chris <laughs> smith bennett? and uh another guy called bennett and um they start they started that place in around 98 and i remember st we, i heard fucking rumors about the place in 2001 where i just started high school um and i remember going around there with this kid who's like never ever going to be a bmx rider in his entire life didn't give a flying fuck about it but just his mum bought him a bike because he was fucking loaded or something like that a really fucking sweet bike too that was pretty jealous of because i was just like fucking noob get some fucking bad bike and yeah, i'm still, still puttering around on a piece of shit but um we we heard about them we went looking for them uh and at the time it was like a track through the bush and one jump but it had this crazy deep hole in the fucking ground where he'd been getting all the dirt out and stuff and that that hole that he started ended up becoming the double bowls that yeah. were there and shit years later um and he chris was actually like he was 
almost as far opposite from Newland as you could possibly get. Like operating heaps under the radar. Nobody really knew that the spot was there or that it even was a spot or anything like that. Uh, Chris wasn't interested in riding at Hazelbrook, you know, and being a part of that like almost elite level yeah. or that upper echelon group. Um, I think because he was riding 24-inch wheels or something like that, but whatever. He, that was why he had went with falls. And he kind of took us in, you know, like particularly me. Like he, he taught me fucking heaps and heaps of shit about war rides and he taught me how to do no foot like that good war ride off the side of the jump yeah out of the, out of the no there was like in the bowl like he oh, there was a ride in the like bowl as well yeah. yeah quarter yeah. pipe um style yeah. war rides and shit and yeah kind of taught me a little bit about digging and stuff like that and then like as he got older which was almost immediate because he's like a thousand years old now something selling fucking houses or whatever it is you're <laughs> doing chris you piece of shit if you're listening to this you're a piece of shit chris i hate <laughs> you so much <laughs> fucking selling houses instead of riding bikes what the fuck man what'd you do to yourself <laughs> you bmx is going to real estate yeah i know what are we going to say to them all fuck all y'all <laughs> 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 heard it here first people yeah yeah put the fucking rental prices down yeah that's bastards. right <laughs> um no that's fine whatever get out of the game that's fine it's totally fine I don't give a shit <laughs> fucking dickheads <laughs> Moving but, on um, from yeah, your, sorry. your your jumps down in, in Lawson, like after you started sort of realizing how to build them and started to kind of build them up a little bit and stuff like that, when do you reckon you started sort of paying attention to BMX in terms of like videos and magazines and stuff and then sort of trying to develop, you know, progressing yourselves and, you know, realizing that this is, there's more to this than the local local jumps and local track and realizing there's a bit more of a BMX world out there. Yeah. I, I think that was um, kind of, that was actually kind of by accident that I discovered that there was any like BMX world outside of what we were doing. Like, I don't know. It's kind of, I'm trying to fucking remember the timeline of, of like how this shit sort of happened. Like, obviously we knew that the shit existed because of Hazelbrook and people would come through there, like fucking big teams, T1 and, and Jimmy yeah. Levan and, you know, all these fucking crazy gods. Kenny Raggett. Dude, Kenny Raggett, fucking anodized red, fucking redneck <laughs> or whatever the fuck it is, you know, like doing Supermans in camouflage pants. I can't think of anything more sexy to me than that image of that man doing that trick <laughs> on the third jump in front three at Hazelbrook, you know what I mean? Yeah. That to me is the fucking mid-school of BMX and then you could not fucking... I don't know. That's the fucking middle of it. Definition. Kenny Raggett doing a yes. Superman on that jump is right in the middle of that time. Um, what was the fucking question again? <laughs> oh, so, no, more, more just you know, like I mean, outside. Of oh yeah, it, that's yeah. right. Sorry, it's coming to find sort of. Um, we like we knew BMX was there, but I'd never really come into contact with anybody outside of like our immediate sort of group of mates that was um, doing it. And then, I, I, I like I guess a couple of years later, I was like fifteen or something. And they had just built the skate park at Lawson, yeah. and like we turned up there one day, and I like the when when you the way you used to walk to, up to Lawson skate park was up over this hill, and as you could come up over the hill, you could kind of catch like the the tops of the quarter pipes in the distance. You know what I mean? Like you see the coping just sticking out of nowhere. Before you were able to see the coping, there was like this like real odd movement, like something f sort of floating in the sky. Or something like that, like above the horizon of where I could see the false horizon before I could see the coping of the quarter pipe. So I kind of like, I was like, what the fuck is going on? And then it clicked. I was like, that's someone airing the quarter pipe? Like, so we've like run up to the top of the hill and it's Ben fucking Piggott just riding Lawson Skate Park. I think he was totally on his own or he might have been up there with one or two other dudes or something young. like that. Young, as, at least, I think Ben's a year or two older than me, but he was still fucking young and he was airing like, he was airing a quarter pipe, which for the Blue Mountains was like, you, you, people just didn't do that shit, you know? Like, we'd, everyone dug jumps. Nobody fucking aired quarter pipes. Nobody knew how to. Like, how the fuck do you do that? There were maybe a couple of guys at Glenbrook or whatever, but they were cut from a different cloth. It was, the scenes were, to, were, were different in ways, I guess. Um, seeing, that kid, seeing that dude ride that fucking quarter pipe, I was like, oh my God. And so obviously we got talking and all this kind of shit. And like, he explained to me that I was doing opposite tabletops. And I was like, what the fuck is opposite from what? Like, what are you talking about? He's like, oh, because you got a, because you are left foot forward and shit. And I had never, I'd not noticed that I rode left foot forward. I didn't notice Where that there was a, yeah. how was, like, I was like, what the fuck do you mean? Like, I just, and then he's like, yeah, every time you ride, your left foot is forward. And that was the first time I was ever like introduced to even a concept of there being different ways that people ride bikes and shit like that. He kind of, um, yeah, he kind of like showed 
all of these like different types of not rules and shit, but you know, like knee over the top tube tabletops and stuff like that. And that was like a whole kind of concept that was introduced. Like we just thought it was like, yeah, I don't know. Like we thought it was like inverts down at the jumps or whatever, like just you, you as flat as you could possibly get them or something like that, or knees pinched near the, um, near the stem, you know, was a good thing or something I like that. I thought you had bow legs back then. Well, I was doing them opposite. <laughs> I, the whole thing was to, you doing the straight know. leg ones are kind of st standing up straight sort of no man I, I, I could fucking snap them you could snap yeah, <laughs> I, I could fucking I, I, like, tri one. I don't want to I, I love that shit going opposite and then this this funny thing though um, Ben kind of like showed the fuck showed me how to do like knees over tabletops to my regular way and I started doing those and I was like holy fuck this is pretty cool okay I can get used to doing this is like you know Justin Inman and shit and those guys those northwestern dudes they're doing shit like that that's cool and then i thought fuck this i'm gonna snap one of my regular ones my my regular ones my opposite tables the ones that i felt really comfortable with and i did and it blew both of my fucking feet off completely because i my brain had just been like getting used to going the other way went to snap a normal one like usual and completely lost both my fucking feet nearly died and i was just like yeah i don't know that kind of threw me off <laughs> i don't know i thought it was i was so cocky up until that point yeah. and then i was just like fuck something i was so certain of went so horrifically wrong and i didn't i didn't see it coming and it, that took that uh that was a hit but um yeah that, i guess that was like my first real i don't know fuck yeah i don't know if it was that or it's hard hard man it's, yeah, it's well, a, lot, guess... a lot of mixed up time around there where a lot of shit a lot of crazy not bad shit but a lot of shit was going on you know you're busy as a 13 year old yeah. you go I guess 13 to 15 life, you know like yeah. where do you find where, where do you, yeah where do you find out about the shit because well, around that same time we started going to all the jams and stuff you know? yeah like, okay. we were quite young going to the um one world band jam up at port macquarie where we met you for the yeah, first yeah, time first time met you port macquarie that's yeah. 2004 or i think four yeah so like yeah, 15 right, years right. ago fuck so I, I was 16 then breakless Damn, breakless yeah. Tall, breakless kid with uncut down slam bars yeah, ripping like that. that skate park. Everyone right. chopped their bars back then, didn't they? Yeah, everyone had cut down bars and it was like, who's this kid with uncut down slam bars? That's He's right. That's fucking right, mean. motherfucker. It's very big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, he was, yeah. Kind of lanky, lanky kid back then. That, that actually... Um happened by sort of, kind of by default and then became a bit of a, a bit of a weird thing that i was connected to like but you know in my own head like oh i run uncut slam bars that's the thing i do now like the end up guys but it, it only happened by default because i'd ordered these bars from dan's comp paid for them with my own money and shit as a fortune and when they turned up i like i went and grabbed the hacksaw to fucking cut them down and my mum came out and went nuts at me and she's like cutting you, them down yeah, she's like hey don't make them that size for fucking no reason like just so you no. can fucking make them smaller you just paid how much yeah exactly that is chop half of them off yeah, yeah it was that entire that entire spiel um and so i was yeah. like fuck yeah okay i'll put them on expecting to go to my mate's house that afternoon and fucking chop them down or whatever and that didn't happen they stayed done cut and that was that it, actually no that's right i fucking went because i was living around the road around the corner from hazelbrook and i went down and rode the jumps and i was like oh my god i went from like the most cut down little tiny bars you could imagine i can control my bicycle fully man i could not believe it like you was doing turn downs and yanking the bars like well and truly past 180 and stuff like i could not believe the amount of control i had compared to how it had felt you know what i mean like it was yeah i didn't know that that was um even possible that you could have you could change a bike part and it would change the feeling of your bike so drastically and so that Port Macquarie Jam was the first event where heaps of crew like you went to with heaps of crew Def right? definitely yeah I think so I'm pretty sure that was the first one did that change your world it blew it fucking blew me away I'd never seen an indoor skate park before then um except in any magazines or whatever that we got to see up in the mountains and it was fucking mind-boggling the smell of it the, the look of everything the way that wood feels to ride under you rather than dirt or concrete or crash on. exactly well the whole thing like it's got this bounce it feels like yeah. you're in invincible like it feels like you can fucking send anything and crash on it and it's like a gym mat you know like it, that's the image that uh, that's how i felt going into that fucking place and seeing what you know all this shit i thought it was the most amazing skate park in the world and i think about it now that fucking place sucked you know like <laughs> walking in and there's that weird mini in the corner and then like a big deck and sh i don't know it was just fucking like nothing compared to today's standards yeah. but at the time it was just like mind-blowing it was one of a few back so then. pumped man yeah. yeah there were very few indoor parks yeah. around i think um what was the one in penrith uh verdex, verdex or whatever? Yeah. that must have verdex, been shut verdex down. was gone by then yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it had gone to uh the m5 no the building's still there 
but um, oh, I forgot. But, had but, really, but it had gone, hadn't it? Yeah, yes. but they moved. They moved to Padstow. Yeah, Padstow, Padstow, yeah. Padstow ended in two thousand and three. Yeah. Did right. too. Which was, the, and that was like. Oh, because me and Daly were talking to Matt about taking it on. Yeah. And that's what started Hell on Wheels. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. Yeah. No shit. I got my license the week Verdex closed down. So I got my P's. Oh. It's like, I can finally take myself to the indoor park and ride till 10 p.m. And they fucking closed down. I had my well, license. Well, Matt gave us the option to take the lease for nothing in the shop. So he just was going to give us a park. And. It didn't happen. Well, we'll but then me and Dale went, we have to spend 80 grand on wood to rebuild the park because no one's going to want to ride the same park again. Plus insurance is probably crazy as well. well. It wasn't bad because we'd been talking with <laughs> the government about freestyle BMX and stuff. So we had a plan, but it was like, nah, it's not going to work out. Anyway. Yeah. yeah well, indoor that? parks. There was not many indoor parks. Four, four years no, later, we started all, the man. shop. So. Yeah. Anyway. But um, I, I, guess, dig I digress. <laughs> well, I guess going back to you growing up in the mountains, Geographically, the mountains is not that far from Sydney. It's not. But when you're a kid, it's a fucking eternity away. Mm -hmm. And this is pre-internet, pre-smartphone, all that stuff. So, like, you guys, the mountains kind of crew, definitely sort of, you had your own sort of unique style, vibe, and just, you know, like, it was like a whole scene, you know? You go to the mountains and it was like, it was a different fucking thing than, than Sydney, you know? Are so we talking like um, getting a little bit later on now, like sort of uh, around the Rowan Zero kind of thing? Like, Yeah, I mean, I mean in, in general, I mean, yeah, all, right. up until the sort of modern modern era with everything. Because I mean, like you were riding Hazo with all the fucking big timers, you know? Like yeah, all I mean, the dudes I, I, I started going there in about 2002 or three, one, two, three, so yeah, 2001, right. two, three, And then I think I was there for the last wave of its prime, like when... You know, it was Glenn Yulin was there with his, his four-wheel drive and all the tools and it was the most dialed. Yeah, and you yeah, were stoked yeah. to be part of it, stoked that he was letting you be there and giving, giving him a hand. And then you had, you know, Stowaway brought over Jimmy Levan, Sebastian yeah. Keep, the federal yes, guys, you know, Sandy Carlson and, and, and Ross there. Tanner and all those dudes. I was there dudes. that afternoon. And then a year later, they T1 World Tour came through. I remember yeah. driving down the hill, down Oakland's Road in my brown Peugeot and then... God damn. We fucking round the corner and there's Joe Rich lining up for the front three. And he just cut off his dreads like a year before and we saw the Joe Rich tattoos. And my friend I was with, Adam, was just, I'm trying to steer my car on the corner. He grabbed my arm off the wheel and goes, that's fucking Joe Rich. <laughs> and I was like trying not to crash the car, you know. That's fucking amazing. And then, you know, so obviously that place in that era, like that probably 2002 and three was kind of like the last wave of when that place was at its absolute, yeah. you know, probably the most famous trails in Australia at the time. You had had a feature I would in say 2020. fucking easily, man. Like yeah. that yeah. place was fucking incredible. Like, yeah. I mean, for the time, it was fucking yeah. incredible. And big credit to, to Glenn yeah, for absolutely. just, wow. You know, and the Douglas brothers as well, man. Yeah, like well, Mick and, um, I raced Mick, Mick and Douglas. Jeff and shit, you know, all I raced those dudes. Mick. <laughs> and, and the other guys as well. There was a few dudes, I can't remember their fucking names and I really don't mean to be mean, uh, mean to be rude and not, um, Pay respect to to those two dudes, but there's two dudes in particular, and I cannot fucking for the life of me remember your names right now. But those two dudes as well, who were uh, you know involved really really early on, and they were they were they're absolutely responsible for fucking whatever I've fallen in love with and whatever's happened in my life. Those dudes drove it through, uh, like they didn't know they were fucking driving it, but they did, and so I thank them endlessly for for that, like that fucking gift of that spot. What is what a fucking thing to give to people, like. Yeah, it's a, and a it, beautiful fucking thing. And it still kind of lives on, which is cool. I'm I mean, it's obviously... It it's, it's, it's a legit it's, spot now, isn't it? It's, it's got council sort of approval. I got council approval for it in 2012. Yeah. Hey. yeah, there was that They big. gave me four days to organise a petition and shit oh, for I it. This. Yeah. I think we got... There was like a Facebook group or something that ended up with like 700 people in the group. Um, the petition was signed by like fucking God knows how many people. It was not an internet petition. It was a fucking real petition. Yeah. Um, and then there was like about 150 people, including like the locals, you know, like all the families that live around the jumps and shit that turned out on the day that the councillor was there to inspect them. Um, the councillor like responsible for sports and recreation, like this dude's like the fucking lamest chode you've ever come across. <laughs> And he's like standing there in the middle of the jumps and he's like, I, I came through here on, on Tuesday. Yeah, well, there was nobody here. It doesn't look like anybody rides here. I was, uh, mate, are you fucking kidding me? I was like, look at all, like, everything's beautifully groomed. It was lo like, this fucking place was popping at this stage. Me and Liv were digging there fucking constantly. There were a few yeah, other yeah. dudes coming and going as they wanted, you know, but 
a lot of the OG group, Strat, fucking Pat, Kenna, all those dudes who come up and lend a hand, Donga, Daki, all, so many motherfuckers. Dan Levy, you know, like he spent a lot of time down there, even though he fucking hated it. He hated riding dirt because he ate shit a lot of the time. But <laughs> he fucking hated it, but he still came and dug because it's what everybody did, you know? Um, yeah, I can't remember where I was going with that fucking point either. But well, you had, it was, it was sort of like the, the council sort of meeting to prove, oh, yeah, yeah, all so, got together to prove that. Yeah, so we all turned up and uh, the council was walking around. He's like, he asked me, so what way do you ride these things? Like, I, Hazelbrook runs fucking downhill to, this, yeah. to the bottom corner of that block. And he's asking me, what way do you ride these things? You know, like, oh, you can ride them fucking uphill and then up that real steep fucking tw- 15 <laughs> feet high down ramp and then you magically make yourself fly further up the hill onto this tiny little scoopy down ramp. Like, fuck off, man. Like, <laughs> the fucking Minister for Sports and Recreation or whatever in the area has no fucking idea about bike jumps and he's just about to bulldoze them. It's like, not on fuck sports, man. I, it blew my fucking mind, though. Yeah. I just could not fucking believe it. And then having the locals come out as well, the, the particularly the ladies who lived across the road, who uh, they, they were such a strong asset to have because That's they explained... Amazing. They explain that there's been kids riding their bikes in there since the 70s. Like, since this fucking 1970s, man. They're like, in, in this particular block, there's been kids riding their bikes, blah, blah, all the rest of it. And they, yeah, they it's pretty were. Pretty good they're still amped on it. They were amazing. They were amazing. Not everybody was amazing, but the, but there were quite a few that were unbelievable. There was some trouble with some of the properties closest to the jumps. And fair enough, too. There were colour bond fences, people, young kids rousing about. People move you know. next door to fucking pubs and shut down gigs. You mm. know, that's yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Luna Park. Yeah, yeah, similar yeah, kind of Luna Park syndrome. Similar kind of thing. It was yeah. weird, and then yeah, the council approved them, which was cool. But they um, to get people away from the the fences of the neighbouring properties, they pulled in the boundary line or pulled it down the hill so that all the run-ins for any of the lines would have um, been uphill, like against the flow of the jumps. So and then somehow into a 180 berm and then go back down the hill. With zero, I don't know. It was it totally ruined it. Um, totally ruined the spot. And so, uh, after that, I was pretty like I was happy to have gotten them taken care of or at least secured for some other generation. There was no fucking other generation. Who the fuck am I talking about? There was no other generation to take care of the fucking jumps. But I just had jack of it. I was just so fucking over it and sort of um, pretty burnt out at that stage at like trying to give a fuck about shit that. I, there was no fucks getting given back you know it was just like pouring yourself into this constant endless fucking battle um finally winning that battle and then them having to fuck me over anyway like mm. you can keep the trails but uh, ta, 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 you mm. can't have any space to fucking pedal into them or to ride towards them you just have to start on the first ones up ramp BMX, definitely yeah. but you we won't touch your jumps but we'll touch all the ground before BMX, the jumps bmx That's is a tough one because I mean, ultimately, like, why do we do it? We do it because we enjoy it as individuals. We can do it with friends and we can we can do it. It's not a team sport. It's not like a community sport. And racing, maybe, to some extent. But if you're going to talk about riding trails or riding street or riding the park, it's what we get out of ourselves. Yeah. So it's very hard to rally a lot of people to get a movement to make big things happen. It's, you know, and I think I had to suck that up when I was pretty young as well. Totally. It's quite a hard thing to shove. Yeah, you're shoving stuff uphill. You are. What was it that made you sort of realize? Just being a kid, yeah, with jumps and skate parks or spots, stuff to get shut down, getting just yeah. even just getting kicked out of a spot for riding it. Yeah. You know, you're always pushing shit uphill to be able to do something. Um, but yet, if you had the backing of a team or you had the backing of a I guess even a BMX club, you can make shit happen because you've got more people. And yeah, it's, yeah. It's, a, it's a hard thing to have to get around because you want to ride a bike by yourself. You're not riding a tandem. Yeah, exactly. You're not riding a fucking goodies bike with four people on it. And it's it, what you do by yourself. You know, And you can go and do it by yourself. And yeah, it's better to do it with your friends. But Well, we thought we were doing it by ourselves, you know? Like we thought we were minding our own business, spending time in the bush, building jumps. Sure, we were drinking and shit, but we're not like graffitiing. We're, there are lots, it's cool to do it by yourself. And you can yeah. go and do that in the bush by yourself, but you aren't going to get any support from a council. Mm. That's the thing. Yeah, yeah, you know? no, yeah. Um, I guess, yeah. I thought with Hazelbrook it'd be different, but I know better now, which is why, um, which is why my jumps <laughs> fucking nowhere near Hazelbrook. But it's yeah. in the Olympics, yeah. man. You know I mean? It's in the fucking Olympics, so. Yeah, but the, mm-hmm. you know, fuck. If kids can win gold council. medals, then you'll get some money. Yeah. Because the Australian government will pay money for gold medals. Not for dirt. For, for digging. 
<laughs> yeah. I don't think anyone gives For a winning a gold medal, they will pay whatever it takes. Yeah, you know, to win a rowing fucking gold medal, dudes who just like go the wrong direction can't even see where they're going. <laughs> They'll pay millions of bucks to try and win it, and they never fucking win it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Look at the regatta center. Yeah, exactly, yeah, right? yeah. Right, so what if that was trails? No, yeah, I, I, I understand the, um, if the theory more, behind it. And, sure. and, and, there is a, and there is a, you know, it's just a roll of the dice, but mm. what are the odds of us winning a gold medal in the Olympics? Pretty fucking good. They must be pretty high because there's not too many competitors. So, you know, well, we're only allowed eight people in the whole Olympics well, in yeah. freestyle, you, isn't it? Is you don't it, reckon the Jamaican any? bobsled team will be pretty good at it? At BMX. Yeah. They'll make a movie about it. They need to, they need to hustle. No, not that. We'll need to hustle. We've, we've been training for this for fucking years. I know. <laughs> I mean, I mean that, that's the thing. And you were talking about how um, the Chinese are going to try and, you know, we got Rob, Rob Darden, his BMX master Darden, yeah. being paid by the Chinese government <laughs> yeah. to train yeah. gyms to be yeah. BMX athletes because they have air awareness, which yeah. is insane. To yeah, that's, weird, that's weird shit that I just fucking do not connect with on any fucking level. It's, like, it's ridiculous. Like, right? That you can have... Okay, like, <laughs> yeah, fuck, let's go. Fucking Jesus Christ. All right, let's do it. So there's like... How can you how can you have an Olympic se- like a fucking setting right where there, you know, there's a bunch of people competing on bikes and the, the people who are judging the bike riding are people that have fucking lived bikes forever and ever and ever and you have somebody out on the course who's like doesn't give a flying fuck whether they come first or whether they come last I mean obviously no, they, they fucking do, they do because they're at the yeah. fucking Olympics and shit or whatever okay like having somebody that has lived and breathed BMX and wanted nothing more than to ride a bike, maybe started riding out of fucking necessity, you know, like as a, because you've got to get the fuck away from your family. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's a need to ride your bike because it keeps you safe, because it keeps you out of harm's way and keeps you away from fucking home. You find your passion, you fall in love with it. Everything fucking happens perfectly for you. And then you find yourself somehow exalted in the Olympics. Fucking you're in the finals and you're coming up against somebody who took it up a year and a half ago and has been put in a fucking gym for 18 hours a day for the last year and a fucking half. And they're sitting right next to you. They're yeah. not going to make the final. Who the fuck do you think deserves it more? Those kids aren't yeah. going to make the final. Do you think it's the, the kid? Like, but that's, that's, it's the fucking, it's just so ridiculous. You it can't is. put BMX in the But that's the bullshit like of the that. Olympics because... Every country, I think it doesn't fucking belong there. Every country gets to have an athlete in it. There's those movies about it, like well, Eddie the I, Eagle I, I or the Jamaican Bob yeah, team. No, but, but I didn't start riding shit, BMX bikes but to be not an at athlete. That level. I didn't no, want exactly. to be a fucking athlete. Exactly, yeah, I don't want to be associated yeah. with fucking athletes. That's why I did this shit. The only good I grew thing up about looking it, up to Christian Hosoi and fucking Vic Murphy and shit like that. Yeah. You know, fucking Henry Rollins. Not fucking. If I wanted to be an athlete, I would have wanted to be like Pete Sampras or fucking Michael Jordan or what. Is tennis in the Olympics? Yeah, I think it is, but you're not allowed to be professional. It's amateur like boxing or something, right? Oh, I don't know. Does that mean Logan Martin and Lupos can't be in the Olympics? I don't think we have the same oh, They won't be able to have a monster hat. No way. No what logos think... in the Olympics on your helmet. No fucking way. You have to really? wear that shitty Australian jersey, the Are white. Are you fucking serious? Yeah, they're, they're not allowed to wear logos in the Olympics. No. Fucking suck it, you dickheads. You just got to get amazing. Your, you just got to get tattoos of your sponsors. Bah! <laughs> <laughs> what a fucking bunch of dickheads. Logan, and, and, and as if you get a tattoo of your sponsor. As if you get a tattoo of your sponsor. Yeah, what, what, what fools we are. <laughs> oh, fucking dickheads. How dare they? What, they don't think that that company is just going to drop them in a second? <laughs> Why the fuck would they go and mark their body forever with fucking bicycle companies? Like, what the fuck? They come and go and drop them out. All right, so the Olympics are coming up. Kids, kids could win a gold medal. It's going down. But d- does it matter? I mean, to BMX as a whole? No, it doesn't matter at does all. Does it matter? Can you still dig so. in the bush? Fucking oath, I can. That's can, like that's where I, you know, it's fun to it's fun to get riled up and have a laugh and shit. But that's all. And it can is. little Johnny in Year Seven get more pussies in the football fucking team? Well, yeah, every day of the week. But he doesn't need the fucking Olympics to do that. <laughs> it's true, actually. It's true. Ah, uh, people it's are smart true. these days, man. They know football players are fucking scumbags. They yeah. always have been. They always will be. Yeah. Like. I actually read a funny um, piece of, uh, it was like advice from a suffragette, a suffragette. Um, and she's like, says, uh, yeah, she's like, don't fucking, don't hang around with, um, this is wedding advice for young women, by the way, from, from a suffragette. And she's saying like, uh, don't hang around with the boozers, with the people that like to, uh, you know, spend time up at night, football players, all this shit. And that was like fucking 150 years ago. It's old knowledge, man. Was football around 150 years ago? Yeah, dude, he's probably they kicking around stones. Balls. Dude, it would have been a stone. You wouldn't kick a stone. Fucking oath, Think would. about your toe. Are you serious? Look at these fucking meatheads. That's why they wear the, they, they kick the shit little air ball. 
that's because they kept breaking their toe on the rock. Pussy toes. They were like, fuck, this is a slow game. Everyone's getting injured pretty quick. How, what can we do? We need a lot of rock. <laughs> Somebody come up with a fucking lot of rock. <laughs> Here's a lot of rock. All right, back to the real stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, oh, okay. Yeah, going back to the timeline, I guess. Uh, <laughs> back to prehistoric. Um, well, yeah, I guess, yeah. Um, yeah, Hazelbrook aside, I mean, obviously, yeah, obviously the dynamic changed once they changed the boundaries and you fucking couldn't start the yeah, same place. Yeah, and it almost broken. felt like flogging a dead horse trying to get that place working i mean i moved up there in 2012 and i think you yeah, were pretty much yeah. done by that yeah. point you were kind of over it and then i think alex and i had a bit of a little push to try get some things you were actually injured for a, a good portion of that year that i lived first year i lived there was i yeah what the fuck was wrong with me then i don't remember but i remember you, i got broke off very often you kicked we, the ball. Um, I <laughs> stone, a yeah. big stone ball and <laughs> fucked his toe but yeah like yeah. and and yeah. We, we me and me and alex tried to we had a, f- a few heavy heavy dig days in the rain to try maybe that all those little rollers that kind of stuck we kind of built that little uh-huh. dumb rolling thing kind of which is still it, there still there now yeah. actually that track still is there now it gets used i think but it's it, again it was like flogging a dead horse a little bit it was sort yeah. of a little bit sort of done i know some younger kids still went there and and had a bit of a ride and it still gets the odd fix up here and there with nathan yeah, yeah. nathan cousin and his son Bryn live around the corner and they do definitely put some work in there which is cool and ben as well, I know Ben, Ben O'Shark. I don't fucking know his real name, but he calls himself Ben O'Shark on the interweb. So shout out to that dude ben as well. O'Shark, he spends yeah, spends time digging. Actually, he just got the two big dogs at the end of the 46 line running. So, oh, really? Yeah, so congratulations to him. him. Good That's on right. you, Ben. You fucking legend. He actually jumped the last one, which is something that we never really accomplished. Actually, no, I don't even know if he jumped it. Sorry, you suck, Ben. I don't even know if yeah. he jumped it. So, <laughs> But well, he, right, but he well, fucking well, did. Yeah, well, dialing back for probably just before that last incarnation of Hazelbrook when you were in there, I guess your mountains crew, which is probably around, you know, not just after the time I met you guys and you kind of the end of the Wentworth Falls era, mm-hmm. you had, you know, yourself, you had Rowan, you had Daniel Levy, I guess there was Will on his mountain bike, mm-hmm. 26 and 24-inch stuff. Strat. You had jumps, oh, Strat, so, yeah, Strat, yeah, you had... Um, Kenna. They were all the jumps at Rowan's house, Saddle Clubs. Yes, we did. Club. Yep. Tell us that's, about that spot. I mean, that yeah. was a pretty short-lived little thing, but it looked it, fucking rad. It was kind of there for a little bit longer than... Uh, it was like... Yeah, it was there for a while in a few different uh, incarnations, I suppose. You know, like And, and at, the end of, at the end of it, or, or where it was like really fucking getting serious, I suppose, um, the 11-year-old kid next door had like just turned 11, which for him and his family meant that he was allowed to drive the 30 ton excavator that his father owned Boom. bang so first thing Ron did was ask his kid to build him two jumps that were the size of the fucking moon each like these things were yes you should have seen the, you should have seen the fucking height of the down ramp on the second one there was just no way you could build a kicker up to it you know how like opportunistic you, it was yeah it was hectic <laughs> having this 11 year old dude fucking driving around a 30 ton excavator That's... just like what are you doing? You know, he's fucking Irish or whatever. He's name's Connor, lovely kid. He's probably an adult now. So Should sorry, <laughs> Connor, but he's heaps young. Should be there. running this country. I used to fucking hate him too because I actually crashed in one of the berms at, at uh, Rowan's like real, real bad, like where you wash out and just go straight into the fucking face Ooh. of the face of the berm at, at, at high speed. I did that and I looked at like this kid was just pissing himself, laughing at me, like genuinely laughing at, at the comedy of the. I guess a slapstick of it or something like that and I fucking took that to heart I didn't let him know that I took it to heart but fuck I did and uh, yeah that cut me deep for a long time but anyway so when he was digging the jumps in the excavator that was pretty cool we had some wild shit going on down there they, they were um, they were really, really good and they were they were getting to a point where um, I guess even on a on a, like a national scale they were like recognisable as some fucking jumps you know that you, there's still before like 2006-ish I think they no 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 it was a bit later than that but anyway wasn't big on social media and that kind of crap and it was it wasn't yet playing a huge part in people's lives at that point or anything so there wasn't huge amounts of photos and things like that but there were just sessions there fucking constantly the jumps were amazing they're never tarped you know like tarping jumps is something that's brand new in the mountains like i mean i don't know what the fuck i'm talking about i'm the only kind of digs in the mountains me and my fucking mates up there alan shit right and mike no other person digs up the mountains. So what am I talking about? Tarps never get used in the mountains. No fucking can use a tarp except <laughs> us, right? So there's nobody else digging. So no, use the shovel. It like it's a fucking general. trend. Yeah. There's a, yeah. So <laughs> anyway, uh, I can't. Not even the fuck I was talking about. Then 
saddle clubs. Yeah, I'm getting there. Um, so, yeah, they were, the jumps was just really starting to get to a point where they were amazing. They were taking care of themselves and the lines were getting longer and longer. That's where tarps come in handy is that you're able to build longer lines because you don't have to maintain the shit at the start of the line anymore. It, can't, it can be longer than three jumps long. We had gotten to some pretty fucking gnarly uh, lines and shit like that and the last down ramp on the last jump, which was a fucking long jump, which had a tall up ramp and a tall down ramp, um, Strat... Uh, Blast the fuck out of that Strat was a killer rider Blast the fuck out of that Landed on Super dry guy down ramp This is where it all comes undone Landed on that Washed out front wheel Hit his head With no helmet on And got knocked the fuck out Really really badly Like he It was like Real fucking scary And after that Rowan's parents Who I think his dad's lawyer And his mum Is just a lovely fucking woman But obviously Pretty responsible They were like Alright Fuck this shit we can't have kids coming in here fucking crashing and dying and shit in the yard. Um, we're going to have to like, you know, we, I was scrambling like, cause this place was like my home, you know, I just poured my heart into Hazelbrook or whatever. And all these other places that had sort of gone and come and gone, I suppose. And then um, it was happening again, you know, like I was fucking, it was just another devastation to lose like another spot because of semantics, you know, like Strat wasn't upset about the crash. He knew that this crash was like his responsibility or our responsibility for having dug the jumps. Nobody was putting pressure on anybody to, um, y- you know, to, to tighten any rules or anything like that. Uh, and I don't know what was going on with, uh, yeah, Rowan's like fucking uh, personal life or, or anything like that at the time. Um, but those jumps were kind of bulldozed by that same 30 ton excavator or something because they had to, I think, fix a horse arena, a horse fucking dressage training arena that was above where the jumps are. And so they drove the excavator over the jumps to go up and do that, and that was the end of that was the end of that. Yeah, right. Yeah, that was that was um, that was a ball terror. But that was actually one of the fir- uh, yeah, I had one of the first ever photos I shot while I was on SM was down there doing a turn down on my dirt bike. I was super super happy about Fuck that. Yeah, yeah, that's some fucking old shit, man. Yeah, I mean, and when yeah, so you've been you got on SM a pretty long time ago, back when SM was distro through ECI the first time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, dude. I mean, that's got to be, yeah, probably one of the raddest things. Like, you know, you, what, you know, not many people can be as, I guess, synonymous with a brand, especially in Australia. In Australia, in Australia people yeah, no, no, get no, no, chopped no. and changed quite often because distro know, like changes. It, it happened, man. Like, to, to be honest, like, honest, like I, I kind of know now how I got put on in the first place. Like, I, I would through knowing Alex um, and then kind of knowing Gorak, I guess, and, you know, I don't know. Being Alex a is a medal. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And so they were under the same roof, you know, and I think yeah. Alex had an ear in Gorax. Uh, sorry, a, a word in Gorak's ear and kind of was like, hey, let's do a bit of shake up of the team. He thought I fit the brand. They, Gorak thought I fit the brand or whatever. And I remember, I remember the night at, at, um, he fucking, I think he texted me, the rude prick. He didn't even call, right? I was like at work fucking cooking fucking dinner it's a rest. phone call moment not, yeah, a, right? not a text moment i know and he fucking texts me hey <laughs> he wasn't he breaking me, up hey with what's you? your dream setup and i wrote back to him like uh oh, dirt bikes slam bars pitchforks rah, 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 all this shit um why what the fuck do you care like i haven't spoken to you in months <laughs> fuck you give me a call about <laughs> and he's like oh well because i thought i don't know whatever some gorak way of going about tell, letting me know that i was going to be sponsored by snm from then on and i i fucking hit the roof i could not fucking believe it like I went from having all my bikes stolen, having shitty bikes, all this kind of crap. And then f- from no fucking sponsor, no fucking nothing. Like I mean, I had a couple of photos in the mag. You had a few photos in the know, mag. Like that years. type of shit. And I might've been like, do, we might've put on an event or something like that. But it was like from fucking nothing to, hey, here's a whole bunch of shit with the one fucking logo on it that you could never afford, that you looked up to for your whole fucking life. Yep. Here's all of it. He, like you know a frame and shit it's like australian sponsorship it's not like you know i can roll it in product or no. anything but for me that was like and Big still time. now i cannot fucking believe that that ever happened and i feel so fucking like snm growing up for me was like oh my god like it, it was the shit that it was the bike parts that you knew that you could trust that only the best riders had because they somehow had a connection to somebody who was fucking somehow i don't know getting them from America or something like that. That's and if you, happens. once you had that part, you never had to fucking worry about buying another part. Once you had pitchforks on your bike, you never had to fucking buy pit. You never had to buy forks again. That was the, that was what 
the allure of the brand was yeah. and then all of a sudden i had an opportunity to have all of that shit for like for fucking nothing like what I, I, yeah and then it's like 10 years later and it's still sort of sort of going on and i, I don't know how the fuck that's managed to go <laughs> on that, that long like five distro changes and shit and or four or something all this crazy shit and like yeah somehow I don't know. I maybe I don't take I don't take much from the brand. I try not to take much from the brand because I I fucking believe in the quality of the product. I'd rather the product be in someone else's hands than mine because I fucking know that it's good. I know what I'm writing and I trust what I'm writing. If someone else is writing, you've run a bike for a long time, don't you? What's that? You run a setup for quite a while. You don't yeah, change, yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't shop it. and change your setup. No, 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 no. You're, you're, you're thrash long it. time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you're yeah. custom made custom frame it yeah. was 21.75 it was yeah. what half dirt bike half ATF. atf kind of thing yeah you had that for four five years five years yeah, yeah. Five do, years do you reckon you need to spend time on a bike you spend time on a setup and if you do it for multi-years you really start to be able to ride it good i i kind of found the opposite with um with the custom like I, I used to be able to ride any bike any size didn't matter what it was mm -hmm. and i would ride it happily and work it, figure out a way to to Make ride it, it you know yeah. like but before to ride i around the limitation yeah yeah before i got sort of um i got a little menial sponsorship with a local bike shop called life cycles um and through them i was able to get a metal bikes rebel contender frame but before that i was on back. this fucking secondhand norco fucking something <laughs> that had like a 16 and a half inch back end and 19 and a half inch fucking top tube right and that was the bike i was riding top tube. well yeah. but that was the bike i was riding in, in in the shit that um like john first ever put me in his videos you know like this really piece of shit old fucking bike and all this crap and then uh like i had a, a slightly better bike the, through the the rebel contender and it was like i that was the first ever american made frame i had and Do i you know couldn't norco was in rad it. they had a factory rider in the movie rad they what they're a big Canadian brand. Really? They're making Cromoly bikes way back in the day. They had yeah, a factory no, rider in the I know movie. Been around, I know they Alongside been around Mongoose and Redline and GT. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, but they were still shit. Look, they were killing it. In but they the weren't fucking killing mid -thousands, it. In the mid thousands, they were no, shit. They That's true. You got me there. <laughs> yeah, no, in the mid thousands, they could fucking <laughs> suck a bag of dicks. Luke Medill rode from that tried to disc brake on a race bike back then. It was heinous. It was yeah, who was that other one? Ever. Kalen Young as well. He rode That's for right. Norway as well. And look how that went. Double back here, though. He raced the Olympics Case. in London. No shit. So did the dude with a name called Kamikaze. Though. Kamikaze so changed fucking, his what name. What am I going to think about racing after that? Changed his name by deep. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was fucking Kamikaze, man. No wonder BMX doesn't get any fucking leverage. Or pussy. <laughs> or pussy. <laughs> what, what, what do you do? Oh, I ride bikes. I oh, like my friend Kama. Could I get your name? <laughs> I'm Kamikaze. <laughs> Wasn't he Kamikaze Kamikaze? He was Kamikaze twice. Like no his first name was way. Kamikaze, his surname was Kamikaze. Couldn't he have had half half? Uh, hi, or Kama and Kazi. What's your last name, son? Your last name first, Kazi. Fuck. First name, Kami. Fuck. I'd rather kill myself than change my name to Kamikaze. Yeah, let's end that here. Maybe that makes me a Kamikaze. Yeah. Well, Kamikaze to avoid the fucking Kazi. All right. Back All right. to getting some coverage in magazines, yeah. dude. You've so, managed to do pretty well over the years. <laughs> Somehow, I don't know, you guys just kept putting me in the fucking magazines and I thank you every single time for it. Like I, just, I seriously did. If I didn't actually do it, I'm sure I sent an email that didn't make its way through saying thank you so much. There wasn't any spam filters back then. It fucking, no, it wasn't. That's why I ended up in the fucking <laughs> magazines. <laughs> when Google didn't exist when the Mac started. You do understand that. Yeah, but I, I, I'm the perfect example of who you know, not what you know, to be honest. You I knew think, some good like, photographers. I did know some great, great photographers. I was very fucking lucky. You've had some good photos. times. I mean, I've heard stories about getting photos. I mean, you had the interview issue 45, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was late in the piece. You were late getting to me, but that's fine. I don't think about that. Well, I had to, I had to I lay mean, off. I mean, I just look at I just look I had at to the, lay off because you had an interview with another Mac. I look at the 48 issues or whatever it was before me and i go through and pick out the people in there and think like oh, wonder what it was but you'd had photos in there before that, that interested you matt know, holmes about him so much that uh he thought he would interview him before me but you know but we had to, to their we own. had to get the crew together we had to get the crew together you had to have a that's a joke by the way <laughs> fucking jesus christ <laughs> <laughs> fucking hell so um, um the spread that you know the interview that worked out in the mag mm -hmm. yeah, yeah that was going to go in rebel yell 
Well, that's what I thought. Yeah. And, and that's why it got held off being in 2020 for so long. Yes. Yeah. It was fucking, those photos were fucking four and a half years old or something by the At time least. they came out in the, um, yeah. in the mag. And I, that was another thing that totally just fucking pissed me off, broke me down about the whole system of trying to do it. Um, like, what's the fucking point? Like, you go out yeah. and stress and do all this shit that you fucking, you know, you like you want to do, but you're kind of on the border about it or, you know, whatever it may be particularly shooting with um, Pollock is, is high pressure. Uh, I told you guys, I, you know, I was talking earlier about how um, Pollock was meant to make a weekend at Rowan's Jumps when I was riding great. I was feeling really positive. Everything was going good. Um, and he canned on the, the Friday that he was meant to come up or some, something like that. Uh, and then I didn't see him again for months and months and months. And by the time I next saw him, I developed like a love affair f- with fucking MDMA uh, and it like totally changed into a fucking piece of shit human being, you know, like the, and I wasn't able to ride to the abilities that I wanted to. I, I didn't sh- show um, shit that I wanted to do and all that fucking stress and all, you know, all that fucking shit, getting the jumps right. And then he wasn't ready. And then he's fucking ready and I'm not ready. All this fucking bullshit. And then the photos get sat on for fucking years. And then you just wait for years and years and years and there's just nothing happening. Like, no one else wants to do anything with you because you're meant to have this thing in Rebel Yell that's never coming out, literally never coming out. It frustrated me as much as you, I reckon. Man, he's not going to release the photos because he photos doesn't know there. if he wants to fucking do it. Yeah. I know, he's fucking amazing, right? Like, yeah. he took the good photos. He took yeah. great photos, not releasing them and shit like that. And that pissed me off because I had other shit that I wanted to be doing on my bike. I wanted to move well um, past that point you need it's like a I step want, you need that stuff done i wasn't able next. to yeah i yeah. wasn't able to get to the next step because there was this all this there was fucking five years of umming and ahhing and bullshit before before the fucking interview came out by then i was a fucking drug addict you know i wasn't riding fucking every day living and breathing bmx i was fucking partying thinking that that was it's a know, hard time I man I, I mean i've seen so many people go through that time you know like you know you're 16 to 18 so many kids I knew shredded. And they hit 18, you can get a license, you mm. can drink alcohol, you can vote, you, can, you know, you probably got a girlfriend by then. You, you know, you buy your car. It culls the fucking BMX field like that quickly. Kid at 16, 17, possibly the best in the world. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. culls. And you've only got a few crew left to ride at 18 years old. That's fucking true. You got um, even, even less than 30. <laughs> yeah, it's very true. Um, you've smashed some hard yards in your time going through that phase. Yeah, it was fucking, it was a bit, I went through it, at, I guess, at a bit of a different time as well. Like I was late because I was so, uh, I was just like 100% on BMX, right? Like yeah. I didn't, it wasn't that I was focused on BMX or making like through BMX, but I, through BMX, I was having fun and I was meeting yeah. people that liked me and people yeah. that fucking wanted to hang out. It people defines that, you, man. Yeah. That I loved, you know, like yeah. meeting all these guys and shit that I just were the sickest motherfuckers in the world, you know, like the best people to hang out with. That I, there was nothing else in the world that was even coming, like that yeah. was providing that type of entertainment for me in, in any kind of way, you know, and like to have, to have that somehow soured by some outside influences and shit like that, you know, and then like, yeah, I don't know. That turns into the partying with the friendship aspect of yeah. having the BMX stuff. Um, you like, you start hanging out. Fuck the bike. We're just good mates anyway, right? Like we're fucking bros and all that type of thing. And then, yeah, you're just partying more and more and more. Like I was saying, I got into that a bit later. Like I didn't really, I don't think I fucking did ecstasy until I was like 23 or something like that. Or MDMA, I should say. But when I did, it was like... Mom blowing motherfucker this you gotta be kidding me like I, I thought i'd felt love in my life and all that type of shit no fucking way it should Jeez. probably be legal really they, they should be doing something with it because it is it connects people it can connect you to yeah. shit that you've it never was felt designed for to. marriage counseling no shit that's what it was designed yeah, right for. they're using it now big time they're studying it hard they're trying to make it legal yeah for they're like using it for PTSD, PTSD shit, for yeah. veterans coming back from war it's got massive it works really quickly. I, I could not believe my my like heart could feel so much. I could feel so, you know, or that I could see this such beauty in the world. I'd never ever seen the world in a way like that ever. And it's not a, it's not a hallucinogenic drug, but it just makes no, you fall not. in love with this shit. Yeah. Um, and I had absolutely fallen in love with, yeah, with with how it made me feel. But 
fucking swinging. It's not a, not a good thing to fall in love with like that. You know, yeah. it doesn't love you back. It's got a place in it. I think it's got a use by date as well. Oh fucking in oath. your life. Yeah. yeah, that's that on off switch that I lack the. I don't turn off. I don't turn it off. You know, it's like a tough I, one to learn, I just man. keep going. You know, I just want to. I just want to keep chasing that high. Fuck, chase that high many many nights. You know, like it was, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't always fucking <laughs> sober sunshine. You know, like chasing that fucking high on your own. We're talking about hot. you've been sober for a while now. I have, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've been I've, like sober. I haven't had a drink since the 30th of June 2017. And you're feeling is, good. I feel fucking amazing. Absolutely fucking amazing. Every fucking day is just like I. I also have depression and shit. Every fucking day sucks balls. Like I, there's so much shit going on in my fucking life that it makes me fucking hate the fact that this is it this is the existence this is the one f the one shot but not drinking makes me excited to face all of that shit because i know that at the end of that day i'm stronger for having gone through it alcohol is a is a perfect way to be like fuck all that shit fuck all the hard shit that i got to do fuck all the hard shit that i got to go through i'm not going to go through that i'm just going to fucking sit here and do this thing or whatever and you can do that for as long as you fucking want, but it doesn't change the fact that you you're going to anything. have to, you're just going to have to go through it at some point. Yeah. When the fuck are you going to go through it? That's the, that's the choice that you have to make, I suppose, or it's at some point a penny drops or something like that. For me, that was give, giving myself distance from alcohol, enough distance that I, like I see alcoholism or abuse of alcohol as like a bubble. When you're in the bubble of alcohol use, you can't see negative ramifications because, yeah. and I'm talking, like I don't think it has to be regular or drastic amounts of alcohol that, that change the way that you feel about it because you're in the bubble. If you're in the alcohol culture bubble, you are constantly drawn to it through all of the you know cultural associations celebration and all the all the fucking rest of it and all that kind of shit but it keeps you fucking retarded to what it's actually doing it to you. it's fucking poison like i guarantee it slows you down if you drink a couple of beers a week it, will, it you're dumber for having drunk those couple of beers a week than if you fucking distance yourself being outside of the bubble after however many months sober it was and you fuck it's different for everyone i'm sure but i fucking knew when I wasn't drinking anymore. I fucking knew when I had control of it. I fucking knew when I wasn't an addict anymore. Not, it's hard to say not an addict anymore because I don't drink. Whereas like if I wasn't an addict, I'd be able to drink and it wouldn't be a problem or something like that, right? But I don't know if that's how I see it. I just fucking don't want to go back in that bubble yeah. ever again. How long did it take? You reckon like a month, two months, 90 days till it's clicked? For me, uh, okay, so like 30th of June, I was given an ultimatum by my partner. We had a two-month-old baby. Uh, You're a father now. Yeah. Three-and-a-half-month-old yes. baby together. She kind of gave me an ultimatum, like you have to cut this shit out or, um, or you know, you can't be in a kid's life kind of thing or I can't be around you anymore. You're like you're a danger. You're a fucking liability. And I was. Um, I kind of took that ultimatum uh, and I decided that, okay, I'm going to give it a sh bit of a shot. Kind of thinking in the back of my head like, you know, fuck her. Like, I'll probably go back to drinking. I'll stay, I'll be sober for a few weeks or something like that. Um, and then probably, you know, go back to drinking. That was my usual pattern. Or yeah. If I, if I, and that was a serious effort to get to a few weeks. But if I could do that, then I could show her that I could, whatever. And then, like, four days after I got sober, I got sent to jail. And so, going to jail, I was only in there for under just under a month. Going to jail gave me the distance that I needed between myself yeah. and alcohol. Then, when I got out, of jail on appeal um that night i really really wanted to drink and i was like i was dead set on getting out and having beers for sure man like i was fucking i was talking to the motherfuckers in the cell that's about the pattern, it isn't it it's a straight pattern. everyone's talking to you about how relaxing it's going to be man you get out you're going to have a beer you're going to smoke blah, 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 all that shit and then um i got out and i was super super keen for it but sorry we got to edit that out my partner was um my partner suggested to me, don't fucking drink. Just put it off for one night and just see how you go. And uh, that, that I was like, yeah, okay, no worries. Fully aware in my head that I was going to take money that I had already seen in the shrapnel jar on the counter and go up to the shop and buy some fucking booze with it. Fully aware that I was going to do that. 
I took the money out of the jar, told her I had to go for a walk because I just couldn't believe that I was outside. I couldn't believe I was out of jail, you know, like this like fucking jail is all encompassing, by the way, to anyone who hasn't been in there. It's fucking horrific. I was outside and I was like, you know, I used that as an, ex- as an excuse to get away from the house. I'm going to go for a walk, experience this freedom and do all this shit. And I took the money out of the fucking jar, which I knew I was taking up there to buy some fucking alcohol and I could have done it. Like it was in my hand. I could have I got away with it, got out of the house without even the coins jingling in my pocket, you know? And I walked up and I was, as I was passing the bottle shop, I fucking stopped. And that, I stopped myself going in the bottle shop and I didn't buy alcohol. This is the first time I have ever taken control of it ever. And ever since then, I called you fucking two minutes after I, I made remember. that decision. And ever since then, I've been in control of it. It's never, ever been an issue for me since then. And I've been to everything, weddings, funerals, every fucking party you could possibly imagine, drug parties, other parties, all, everything you could possibly fucking imagine. And alcohol is just not a, not a thing in my life. Because it's, yeah, it's just, it's just not now. And that's a massive credit to you, dude. I mean, yeah. It, yeah, I guess. I mean, yeah, I don't know, fuck. A lot of shit happened. A lot of shit was going on at the, around the, around that time, you know, like that fucking then and S and M trip and shit like that, like all that crap. A lot of shit was um, shit storming together ar- around then, and it was like really time to sort of shit or get off the pot. Like I, I don't, I honestly don't count myself being here now if I hadn't stopped drinking when I did. So I guess it's like a stars aligning type thing, um, and I definitely take the positive out of all of those negative experiences that contributed to to me having to stay away from alcohol, you know, giving myself that, giving myself, I didn't give myself the distance, but having that distance between myself and alcohol forced on me by jail was, um, was, yeah, fucking incredible. Also getting to see what it's fucking like beneath the surface of society is, is fucking horrific. It makes you really not want to be a part of that. And so, yeah, that was amazing. That opened my eyes to a lot of shit and gave me a lot of drive in the beginning when I needed it. Um, there wasn't really many people, you know, I don't know. It's, yeah, it's a very lonely fucking thing being an alcoholic as well. You fucking, you burn everybody, fuck everybody off and you treat everybody like shit and all that kind of thing. And you wrap it up in booze, you know, and you just cuddle yourself and you tell yourself it's fine, fucking all that kind of crap. You just destroy people constantly. You don't give a flying fuck about anybody. And so when you're that alcoholic that gets to rock bottom, who's, you know, you've got nothing, no one and all the rest of it, you have no one. There's fucking nobody there because you've been a cunt to everybody. So it's like you have to very slowly, I don't know, build your, build a, build yourself up or something you like built, that. Or you built something amazing though. you got a daughter now. Yeah, I do. She's fucking incredible. And that's what you feel. Oh, yeah, man. Like she's um, she's amazing. But like she'd be amazing if, if I was an alcoholic or not, you know. It, no, she'd be a lot more amazing because you're not. Well, I... I I want to experience that yeah. through not being an alcoholic. Like, yeah, regardless of, of, I guess, positioning, at least I'll know that I was there for it. You know, I'll fucking remember her growing up. I'll fucking, yeah, I'm not going to crash the fucking car with the kid in it. You know what I mean? Like, every decision that I make for her life and my life and shit like that is a deliberate, reasonably well thought out decision you know like it's not yeah. like alcohol is fucking crazy you make the craziest most rash decisions ever you know yeah. like i fucking ruin r- relationship after relationship you know lovely woman after lovely woman and fucking just destroying these people because i was a fucking pisshead and had no idea how i did i did have an idea but i just didn't give a fuck about anything because that's that's just what it did to me. I don't know. And that was that was the freedom I found in it. That was the freedom I needed to not give a fuck because I'd been, yeah, I guess, guilted my whole life. Alcohol took me away from guilt. That was where my joy was, I guess. And I found joy somewhere else, I guess, in digging. Yeah. Yeah. So the new trails you're building, I guess that's an upside to this. So you've built Fucking some nice. of the most amazing trails and mountains I've ever seen. I don't think Hazo in its prime is even close to what's going down. No, nah, Hazo in its so prime maybe, is like a bag compared to what I'm doing now, Glenn exactly. Newell and your piece of crap. So right? maybe, <laughs> amateur. So maybe, yeah, so maybe the decision <laughs> old you used man, to, old decision washed up you, man. you used to make with the shovel were tainted. And nowadays you've got a you got something going on. That's it. Well now that I don't have to watch that horrible old man. <laughs> 
dig his jumps and throw his <laughs> rocks around. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he, he built a lip that Fuzzy Hall rode at the X Games. Oh, yeah, I've heard about and this Fuzzy lip. Fuzzy loved this jump. It was true. a beautiful jump, and Fuzzy was shredding it. Fuzzy probably would And be Glenn no did what. definitely tell us about it many times, <laughs> but Glenn's the best. I have heard. No, he is. And everything I say about Glenn, other than love, is a joke. So, sorry, Glenn. Love you. And I've always looked up to you, and thank you for letting me be a part of anything to do with Hazelbrook. Again, I appreciate it massively. I actually appreciate all of the elder writers that have ever <laughs> passed anything down to us, you know? Like, fuck, we owe a lot to the older generation. I'm saying that from my generation's point of view. You guys are older again. So uh, anyone who's younger than me who doesn't say that shit to you guys, they can fucking go and eat a bag of dicks. Because that's <laughs> rude. Some of the kids <laughs> coming up. No, it's interesting, you know, some of the kids coming up. We were just talking about the other day. Wait, we got little Brandon Lupus who I'm pretty amped on how he looks up to a lot of the older generation. Well, yeah, he's... I, I wouldn't have expected it. Brandon Lupos? Yeah. Yeah, right. He's He seems like a kind of nice dude sometimes. Well, he's... Dude, like, he, I'm, he's, I'm not talking shit on the dude. You know, yeah. I've only met him a few times. But, yeah, yeah like, the, from from in the small interactions we've had, sometimes he comes across really nice, sometimes he comes across quite busy. Mm. Um, he had to see Ammon's ass. He what? He had to see Ammon's ass. Yeah, yeah, but who hasn't seen Ammon's ass? Well, I know, but he had to see it in the <laughs> way to a front He had a front flip over Ammon's yeah, naked butt. That's, yeah. that's yeah. pretty flip. confronting. Front flip over Ammon's ass. Because you're basically shoving your face... Straight into it. Uh, <laughs> I've fucking been pretty close to Ammon's ass before. I've spent some pretty loose weekends. This isn't together. a triathlete podcast, so let's just leave that there. Ah, oh, fuck. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I wasn't trying. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was my fault. Get a triathlete. But um, I guess, yeah, if you want to chat a little bit about, about what you got going on with Red Rum and, and yeah, the new spot, I mean... Basically, I remember you invited me up there when the place was still pretty fresh. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in the invited last the entire Australian S and M team through there when the place was pretty fucking fresh, actually. Yes. Tom. Well, yeah. Um, hadn't even jumped the jumps, and then had the <laughs> S and M team come through. Um, we found out 24 hours before you guys all arrived that the third jump was actually a full bike length and a half too long. <laughs> so we had 24 hours to um, completely knock down and rebuild this up ramp, which Alistair Hayes, who is a fucking workhorse genius on a bike lovely man he managed to do that almost single-handedly completely completely knocked down and rebuild this up ramp almost on his own because i was too busy being a narcissist taking photos with james fox off in the bush or whatever the fuck it was <laughs> we were doing. um and now i got stuck into fucking slapping this up ramp in and the next day it was getting threed by will gun and all the rest of it so that was a good, did session, a good man. job man he did yeah. a good job the jumps have since changed from then, you know, like they're, they're getting wild now, deeper in the ground and higher out of the ground and longer and steeper and stuff and changing shapes and all the rest of it. But I just want to, like, it's it's the, the line that we're building is kind of, like for me anyway, it's like a, it was something of a fucking magnum opus or something like that. In that it, it's the best shit I've ever dug in my entire life. It's well thought out, well distanced and like... It, it's fucking perfect it's just exactly what i want to fucking what i've always wanted to not what i've always wanted to ride because those tastes always change you know they always evolve which is why trails are perfect you can build your evolving tastes as they come which is what this line is and it's getting to a point where it's kind of fucking out of hand now <laughs> yeah like, <laughs> you go fucking quick and like the jumps are tall and then uh, they go really high and um it's sick man like it, it's it's everything that i wanted in a in a set of jumps and, and probably more you know i, I like the, the hip at the bottom of the line at the moment, um, I like buried my little brother's ashes into the up ramp of that as a bit of a kind of as a bit of a um, homage to him in the way that he lived his life and he was so fucking loose and he sent it so hard and, and all that type of shit and like having that sort of uh, represented for me in an up ramp is a, is such a weird thing, um, but it's so it's so fucking perfect. It's like it's kind of like a tombstone. It fucking sends you. It's absolutely perfect. Like, it's amazing. It's about the same height he was as well as a dude, which I find like pretty, pretty yeah, wow. incredible. Um, and it's somewhere that I, because he was cremated, it's somewhere that I can go and, you know, I've got his ashes at home and shit, but I'm going to do some stuff with them um, and my dad's ashes uh, together. Like, they're going to go and fucking do some shit or whatever. But the having that spot that's like, that's one thing that I can go to. He doesn't have a grave or anything like that, you know? So it's like, you can go, I can go there and sit there next to that up ramp and I know that like, there's no soul or whatever, but there's that closeness. There's that feeling of, of physical closeness to the, you know, there's bone fragments and shit in the ash, right? Like there's like, 
actual bits of him and you can be close to that and i like i get a lot out of out of feeling that like i was always really super close to my little brother and um yeah now that now that he's like dead it's fucking i, I miss that a lot and so to to be able to get that literal physical closeness is mm. super important to me and that and that exists in that jump Definitely. you know it's 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 yeah it means the world to be able to to be able to have jumped it and to all the guys that have helped dig on that that jump particularly the down ramp the up ramp i did pretty much all on my own um but that was because i kind of wanted to and I, I asked the guys if they could not sort of not fuck around with it too much um but the the down ramp and the guys who helped out in there like fuck me dead they, they yeah that's they, they built something beautiful on that down ramp it just catches you perfectly it is a perfect accompaniment to the to the up ramp and it's the it, it is inch perfect in terms of distance and height it's fucking beautiful it's the most amazing jump i've ever dug and for everyone that helped thanks thanks for fucking digging that shit like that's the type of shit i want to dig that stuff that's like when you i don't know what for me writing it means so much more than just writing some fucking jumps you know but for anyone else riding them, it's like they get cool jumps. It's fucking sick. For me, it's like an emotional roller coaster through the yeah, bush, you know? Definitely. Like, oh God, what am I doing? Like, and digging's it's always kind of shit, been like, a fairly personal thing for everybody. Everyone takes what they, you know, takes different things from digging their own jumps, and I mm. guess, and having their own little sort of little it's almost haven in the bush, you know, doing doing their thing. It, it means different things to different people, I guess, and your new spot and the fact you have started it from scratch on you guys on, on you know like you've been there from the start as opposed to coming into another set of jumps like Hazel that have already existed this is this is your journey I yeah and, that, and, it's, and that was a fucking commitment yeah. to like sorry you go on I didn't no I'm just, I'm just basically yeah crediting you for you know in, in the last 18 months how much that place has grown you can you can tell from your Instagram post and everything how much you love it which is it's a fucking amazing dude yeah, that place that place is pretty hectic, man. Like it's it fucking helped me through some serious shit. I actually wanted to call that line. Um, I wanted to call it sober, because it because when I first started digging it, I dug myself sober. I had didn't have a drink for like three weeks, and I thought I was sober. And I was like, that's a fucking sick name for a fucking line, right? Sick man. Like I'll call it sober, and I'll never drink again. And then of course I like, fell off the wagon or whatever, and heaps of bad shit started going on in my life and i was doing terrible things and all the rest of it got in a lot of trouble um and then and then i remembered almost immediately afterwards that you don't name fucking lions in australia like they're just jumps in the fucking bush you don't call the fucking this is poppet and this is oh i'm gonna go down charleston this time like what? no you're not you just write down fucking child like why not yeah i don't know it just doesn't it's happen Charles, up your space yeah especially no, was, when you're up we just had four pack the front three and the you know it's like it's like having the states fucking called um queensland new south wales and victoria versus western australia because it's on the west of australia the northern territory because it's in the north and the yeah. south it's australia because it's in south yeah. it's kind of um it's like that you know like you have the front three because they're the front three jumps at hazelbrook you have the small four pack because they are the smaller pack of four jumps yeah and the big six pack because they are six bigger jumps. That kind of makes sense. I don't know. I just name and name and lines. I find hard. It was even hard to give the jumps a name. But I think I was drinking then, so I stuck with it. Pretty and, stubborn when I drink. And, and the dirt, that magical red. Yeah, red when it rains. Soil. Yeah. yeah, when it yeah, rains, it soil. fucking looks unbelievable. But that that line when you're hitting it full yeah. speed, it's yeah. got some speed. Oh yeah. There's some space there for you mentally in the air. There is, yeah. It's it's slowly it's time. slowly coming back. Yeah, that um, or learning that that's the time to be free of everything. You know, like learning that this is now the time. Don't stress about other times not being the times where you know you're stress free and all that kind you're of thing. Fucking like, case if you start thinking about that stuff. Well, that's it, man. I I, I was fucking overthinking BMX problem. and getting sketchy as for so <laughs> fucking long, man. Like like just overthinking it why you don't need to overthink it you just fucking just do it let your body do it right like they're the best rides in the world but you don't think about shit i've had the fucking worst rides of my life overthinking shit yeah you know, or thinking about outside fucking factors you you're know? not there you're not present on your bike yeah exactly yeah. just ride the fucking ride your bike you know like through whatever means it is get that feeling get that feeling of nothing it's like you're like slack lining oddly has the same um kind of feeling around like the success to do it like when you're balancing on the slack line and shit like that you really do have nothing going on in your head it's really quite 
a weird feeling, but it's it's almost exactly the same as BMX in that way. Like when you're doing it right, you're not thinking about it. But then when you're trying to focus on balancing and shit, you can't balance. You know what I mean? Like it's it's fucking. I don't know if you guys slack on at all, but tried it once and I fell off. You're thinking about it was, too much, man. I did it in a pool. <laughs> I did it in a pool a couple of months ago with Zoe from Volatile Visions. Yeah, he no put shit. one out across his pool. I walked like two steps. I'm like fuck this. Fucking impossible, right? Yeah. You just don't think about it. You just like I don't I'd know, like rather try and ride my bike and, across it. Be yeah, easy. yeah. They did that on uh, Fear Factor once. Yeah. Yeah, they, a good dude actually did it. Like they tried the contestants. contestants D- Danny McCaskill. Shit. Probably actually. <laughs> it's a fair few years ago, but yeah, he fucking nailed it. <laughs> um, Damn. What are the chances of a wee break? Yeah, I think we might need to it. Can yeah. we do a wee break? Yeah. yeah. Fuck yeah. 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 I think we all need one. Yeah. Oh, oh man. man. I just um, go, I'll, I'll fucking jump back. I'll jump in um, real quick and just like fill you in for. So the last thing, that, the last shit that we were doing together in terms of BMX and stuff like that was the S and M trip, right? And like, so that S and M trip, um, I made a complete fucking jackass of myself the whole fucking trip. And I'm sorry about the shit that I said to you and Bevan in the car. I'm sorry to Bevan actually, just in general for being such a fucking mess. I don't think I did anything that was particularly rude, but I was just very embarrassed by my behaviour. After that, after that trip, uh, when I broke my arm, like fucking broke my arm two weeks before I was due to have my baby, right? Not me, my partner was going to have our baby. So I break my arm two weeks later, have Freddie. Two months after that, I get caught drink driving. Two months after that, I get sent to jail. And that's just, just as I was able to go back to work from the surgery on my broken arm. So... That whole time, three fucking months or whatever it was, I wasn't making a cent. So every cent that I fucking, every cent we were spending, I was borrowing from people and shit like that. Um, so we were in this massive, massive fucking hole. And then at, when the baby's four months old, bang, judge sends me to fucking jail, sentenced me to six months, right? Which is fucking nuts. And by the way, for anybody who is listening, don't fucking drink drive. I went to I went to jail. I got sentenced to six months and got let out on appeal after a month or whatever, just under a month. But that is the recommended sentence to hand down by judges to anybody who's caught high range drink driving. That's the, what they're going to sentence you to six months. So don't fucking do it. Don't fucking drink drive. It's just like mine was a first offence, one charge. Of high range drink driving, no other charges, no fucking reckless driving, no abusing police, none of that shit. I pulled over, breathed into the bag, and got sentenced to six months in jail. That's gonna happen to fucking anybody who breathes, who, who blows high range. That's just the way it is. So don't fucking do that. Don't fucking do that at all. So I go to jail, start getting sober, everything's working pretty well. Um, and then 11 months ago, my younger brother at 25 hangs himself and kills himself for apparently no fucking reason completely out of the blue and for the last 11 months dealing with that has like opened my eyes up to like that's where yeah that's where digging at the jumps got kind of serious and a bit more artistic and meant a bit more to me and things like that to build what I wanted to build in a certain way with a certain level of discipline and passion and aggression in the way that I was digging it was an outlet for for all of that and I wanted to translate so much of what he was unable to translate in his life into this sort of uh line through through writing and stuff like that and that's kind of that's been the the massive driving force at the moment like as I'm getting older and my back's fucked I'm due for some fucking surgery on that and all this stupid shit I don't focus on any of that crap because it's for how fleeting life is and how fucking unbelievably unpredictable it is, you need to be ready to face all of that shit at the start of every fucking day that you wake up. So having the mental strength, the emotional strength to to know in yourself that that day could be the day that your partner dies. That day could be the day that your brother dies or your, your mum or your fucking kid or whatever the fuck it is. Charge into that day. Because it's the same. It's the same amount of risk of them dying that day as any other fucking day. So why the fuck not just absolutely smash it out, go in fucking ready, always prepared and always like eyes open. You know, like looking forward, fucking always looking forward and moving forward, always trying to better yourself 
for yourself, not for anyone else. Like, fuck all the ego shit. Fuck all that crap. Your mission to feel better if you're, you know, a depressive person or cynically inclined even, you know, like cynicism can turn into uh, like abject pessimism if you're not careful, you know, especially if you add alcohol and things like that and you're around similarly minded people, you can drive each other into a pretty deep, dark fucking hole. Um, So being prepared for, being prepared and open to the fact that the worst could possibly the worst fucking shit can go wrong at any fucking minute knowing that that's gonna that it's gonna happen the worst shit you could possibly imagine is probably gonna happen you might as well face that accept that and then you can go on living your life being more productive and getting more out of each day i i find anyway it makes it makes each day more enjoyable for me knowing that it's you know it is fleeting and that it is such a fragile little thing that why not why not exploit all of those wonderful fucking things that we that we do get to have through it through the experience of it all you know all the all the bad and and all the bullshit all the fucking horrible horrible shit is okay as well like that's just normal that's okay sort of water you know water under the bridge type thing always be moving forward always uh yeah that's i just kind of wanted to so I guess like it's it's hard to sort of say this without prompting on a on a um like in a, in a setting like this, but like from that moment, sort of like or two years ago, kind of thing. I guess when Fred was born, or you know, a couple of weeks before that, pretty much two years ago now, we were on that trip or something like that, right? Or close roughly, to, yeah. yeah. It was about um, February-ish, so yeah. Yeah, but just before, like and when I broke my arm, and for the couple of months after that, and actually like for fucking years, this has been developing for years in me, like. But um, I was like, I was drinking well over 50 standard drinks a day every day every single fucking day and taking i would say 80 80 60 to 80 over the counter paracetamol codeine tablets every single fucking day you know what i mean like going to different chemists and shit like that so that they wouldn't fucking stop selling it to you and all this kind of crap you can fucking be you can be that fucked up you can be so far up shit creek and still you can come back from that you can be okay you can find positivity you can find happiness and you can find meaning without having to rely on those same old patterns that you that you always have if you're that type of person you know if you are that type of person i know there's plenty of fucking dudes that have um reached out to me through instagram and shit like that wanting not not advice or whatever but maybe just like wanting a chat or just some sort of contact with somebody that's like been there at that bottom at that fucking i'm to rock fucking bottom that's been there and that's like i'm not dead i you know i didn't fuck kill myself my brother hit his rock bottom and he fuck killed himself right i didn't kill myself i'm still here i'm still kicking and i'm enjoying it i'm i love the fact that i get to live my life with his memory pushing through in me because that's him coming through me you know like I, I live my life in the way that i know that he was psyched for me to live my life happily healthily you know and with a fucking serious need to take advantage of the time and the talents and skills or whatever it is that you've got exploit those about yourself exploit your mental strengths exploit your physical strengths if you, if you have them do the absolute fucking best that you can and, and love every fucking minute of it whether it's good or bad it's 100 percent just what it is meant to be there's not you know not in a weird fate way or religious way or anything like it's that but time, man. for how fucking yeah it, it's i mean you fucking know what it's like to go through crazy shit like you've fucking had cancer and shit like that like that's so fucking gnarly i haven't had cancer i don't know what that's like to face my it's own mortality in a way fight. like you that you face it your own way and it's a different it's, we've got our own stories you know, yeah, I mean, no it's compa- like comparing this stuff. In, you know, in a couple of, in just a couple of years, and it's just a couple of years, not every day in that couple of years is a fucking struggle at all. Like I said, you know, it was the night that I got out of jail. So I've been sober for 19 days, no, sorry, for fucking 27 days or something like that, um, including like the four days before I went into jail. It, like, I still wanted to drink then. Like, I still really, really wanted to drink then. Since then forward, it's been, like, fucking amazing. You just have to make that 
decision for yourself, that controlling decision of your own life where you can master yourself, master your own life and take control, that's where you find that fucking power to do whatever the fuck you want. It doesn't matter what it is that stands... Like it, in terms of it doesn't matter whatever it is that stands in your way, what I mean is you find a way to enjoy it regardless of what it is, negative or positive. You, you find a way to be okay with whatever it is that's happening. And so, yeah, for, I guess for me, I've found that through having, you know, all of everything that I've ever wanted and loved and everything taken away from me and stripped away from me in one way or another. And then being in jail where it's like they literally fucking do that to you. They literally strip you fucking bare. They take away all of your personality, all of who you are as a person. Every, everything that you identify as, as a human being is taken away from you so that you're just, you're nothing but a sack of fucking... You're cock and balls in a fucking green jumpsuit walking around the same as every other fucking dickhead in there. They, you're nothing more than that. And so rebuilding is super important. What do you want to do? What do you want to do? Where do you want to be? How do you want to interpret the messages that the world gives you? And it's up to you. When you have that blank canvas, maybe it's easy to then sort of build the painting that you that you wished you had painted the first time you know yeah. maybe it is about that or something like that but i think it's important and i think that's an important thing that i wanted to say to particularly to a lot of those guys that do talk to me on the gram and shit and in you know in real life as well that there's it's never ever too fucking late like that's gets said so many fucking times and it's such a stupid cliche and all that type of shit but from being on the outside of the fucking hand railing at Echo Point, ready to fucking jump to where I'm at now is like... It's worlds apart, isn't it? I, I could not fucking imagine being that guy, you know, and being so fucking troubled and, and all that shit and, and not having anybody to... Feeling like I didn't have anybody to confide in or whatever the fuck it is, you know? You find that strength within yourself because, you, like, no one else is going to fucking be there eventually, eventually. And you have to develop the strength to handle all those situations on your own whether you want to or not. You have to do that. You have to become mentally tenacious, like physically ready for, you know, whatever physical encounters you come into and all that kind of shit. But the mental preparedness is something that's just so fucking important. Like fucking just, yeah, I don't know. Like We're not taught anything about that growing up, are we? Not at all, Our man. schools teach us what? The, the, you, Math? Schools teach you about a, a set of particular skills yeah. that are only applicable if fucking everything goes perfectly well. If, yeah. if everything not, goes right. They're not preparing us for much. It's not, it's not life that you get prepared for. No. It's this perfect fucking nuclear family style 1950s vision of the fucking future, you know? Yeah. Like go to university and then you come out of that and you make it you have a job that's worth so much money you can pay off the debts you've accrued while you were studying it's a and Ponzi scheme man it's fucking yeah. bullshit yeah hey going back a little bit you're talking about some people that have reached out to you obviously from, from some bad spots just is drop that, some names is no. that <laughs> no, no I, I don't want that I, I want to say more to you like is that a lot to take on board to, some, to, sometimes yeah it is that's um, a confronting thing I think to suddenly have someone then if you've been in a spot to unload on you, not unload on you, but to ask, I asked, ask from you. I asked people to, I went, I, I asked people to after, after my brother committed suicide, it was like, it was like, I could have fixed that. I could have, I could have shown him how to live the way that I live now. That makes me so feel so happy and so excited to get out and fucking just like whatever it is, the shittiest fucking thing. Like I was saying, whatever it is i can i can teach people how to be excited about life it's a challenge it is fucking Take hard man it, yeah. and it's like to to get that motivation have that motivation on your own is fucking difficult but i could i could have shown matt my brother i could have i could have shown him i could have taught him i could have poured more time and energy into saving him from himself so i i fucking put a post on instagram or whatever um not super long after he died asking people if you're one of those people that's close to the fucking edge that lives life like that you know like kind of at 100 miles an hour like you're fucking bulletproof and shit and i don't want to sound like a parent because that's what parents say parents say like you, you think you're 10 to. foot tall and bulletproof fuck parents man and fucking parents are a bunch of cunts but they say things like you're 10 foot tall and bulletproof you think you are i don't want to sound I think like you're seven foot tall and that pretty bulletproof. But it's, <laughs> yeah 
chocolate bulletproof maybe but the, like you're so fragile and yeah i don't know the the kind of i don't know i kind of lost my point there a little bit but into yeah just what were you saying about the guys um guys are reaching out and shit yeah i asked them i asked them to uh you've asked them but taking on board their story because I want to, I want to help them. Inter- I want to help them interpret yeah. it out from outside the bubble, particularly people that drink. Drinking's a fucking poison, man. Like, imagine this as a fucking system, right? Okay, I got this thing. I got this thing that you can take. You can all fucking take it. Anyone can take it, but you don't. You can shoot only to have a certain amount. It'll make you feel pretty fucking good. It's a poison. Don't forget that it's a poison. But you can have X amount of this poison, and it'll, it'll, you'll feel alright. You'll feel rubbish the next day because it is a poison. Don't forget that it's a poison. But we're going to sell the poison to you in packets of 24 fucking servings of it. 24 fucking servings per person. So that's one for you. That's one for you. You guys are both big guys with big dicks. Off you go to have your 24 servings of poison each. Like, what the fuck is that about? You know what I mean? Like, so to, to get away from the bubble of that, like, normalization of poison consumption that, like, because alcohol is not stigmatized necessarily nearly nearly as much as it should not be. Not in Australia. No, no fucking way. Because uh, it's not, it's, it's like that's why there's this peer pressure and shit exists around it where like people can still give blokes a hard time if they're not drinking. Are yeah. you fucking serious? Like are you kidding me in the world that we live in now where you can't say fucking shit to anyone you can still give someone a hard time for not drinking a fucking beer? Get the fuck out of here, man. Yeah. Like. To, tr- to try and show people that there is that they are in a bubble it's all fucking fake when you're in there when you've got alcohol reacting in your brain the way that you're drawn to those like it's party situations and it's shit like that like i think alcohol sits as a part of human evolution it's a technology that's allowed for some growth but it's stunted a lot fucking nice. you know? I mean, it, it, it for a lot of people, it will never be a problem in their life. I'm not like talking to people who who have a control over alcohol and who don't abuse it. I'm talking to people who abuse alcohol and who are looking for, who can't find uh, an answer for themselves. You know, who can't find a way out for themselves. Yeah. There is a fucking way out. It and it's not going to jail. Like it doesn't have to be going to jail. I just kind of got lucky in that one, but I guess that's what I needed to get that time yeah. away you know and and still i wanted it afterwards but whatever it is like i want to fucking help these i want to help those motherfuckers because i was there my fucking brother was there and he's dead for it my older brother is there right now and he can be dead for it any fucking minute like my father was there he's dead for it people are fucking dying you know like yeah it, it just kills motherfuckers yeah alcohol is so fucking dangerous not just because it's like because of the immediate dangers that we all know about but because of the long-term <laughs> effects on the fucking brain that lead these people to how many have doctors such did i deal with that just drilled me and said oh you drink more than six drinks a day for the cancer i got like no don't do that and you smoke six cigarettes but like anyway it all comes out that one of the leading causes of the cancer is alcohol no shit like hiding cigarettes really yeah Fucking hell, man. That's fucking mental. Kept in check. It's probably not bad, but it gets abused. Yeah. We live well, in a culture that abuses yeah. it. That's that's Because they fucking sell you a box of 24 of the cunts. Like, you yeah. can, you get 24 at a time, and that's like the portioned out regulation. You can buy one. I know you can, but who the fuck is doing that, man? Come on, I do that. They sell fucking boxes of cask wine, you know? Like, fucking 40 standard drinks for $11. Yes, please. <laughs> True. Like, that's a, that's a crazy fucking culture. Yeah. And with nothing else available, you're you're allowed this one poison to party with. Yeah. That's it. Not a single other and one. Shut down festivals for the other ones. Yeah. It's Get the now, fuck isn't out it? of here. That's craziness. Yeah. Sure is. I don't know anybody who smokes ten joints and then go wants to go out and fucking bash someone's head in. No, it's not going to happen. Plenty of people that drink ten it's beers. It's not going to happen on MDMA or acid either. No. <laughs> I mean, yeah, if it's acid, well, maybe you should sure someone after had it 10 hits place. of heroin, they're not going to bash anyone either, are they? No, they're, they're not. They're going to be unconscious. But, yeah, I had yeah. a few few, fr- a few friends die recently from heroin overdoses as well. So stay away from that shit, too, kids. Yeah, and the pharmaceuticals. Oh. Damn. Well, over the counter stuff, definitely. 
Well, I'm certainly Ruby glad you've, you've seen a bit of clarity through it. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you reckon's next? Do you reckon you've got a story to tell and teach more people? You think is that something? No, that's I still come up with I still really want to pursue the comedy thing. Like I still yeah. I still really want to. Um, I've like never stopped sort of writing. I guess ideas and concepts for jokes and things like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, not partic- It's kind of weird though because because it kind of um, yeah it took a step back from drinking and wanting to be that guy and all that type of shit. You kind of you shed a lot of the ego and then you shed a lot of the belief that you had in yourself and that kind of like um, rock solid idea that you had that you were like fucking definitely going to do this and definitely going to do that and then you start to question yourself why the fuck do I want to do that like who the fuck do I think I am that or, you know all that kind of thing and so slowly building up like I guess a bit of an ego or a bit of a confidence enough to trust that what I and wanting to do or what I'm wanting to, you know, wanting to create is correct to do that. So to trust that is is really hard. Whereas like when you're drinking, you just blindly trust yourself constantly. Like whatever the fuck happens, happens and that's fine. That's the, your attitude, you know. And then you, you, you don't trust yourself at all because you know that everything that you taught yourself was completely fucking wrong because yeah. you drank the entire time. So you get rid of all of that shit that you ever fucking taught yourself and then you slowly learn, relearn lessons. So There's more than a few comedians that have been drug and alcohol dependent and have pulled the pin on it mm-hmm. and become funnier. Yeah, no shit. And there's quite a few comedians who've died because of their alcohol and drug yeah. dependencies. I mean, look, the martyrs are all out there. So well, many of them. I want, you know, I want to, I want to talk about the stories, um, like the really fucked up shit that happened in my life. That's hilarious. That's fucking funny to me. Like, There's dark humor in every dark, yeah. dark story, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and like, and being able to sort of extract that or pull that out of a situation, um, and I, I like, I particularly like um, the style of comedy, like where people are, you know extremely sort of open and raw but like vicious in the way that they're humorous with themselves you know and like it's like to a point that's like fuck what the fuck's wrong with that dude or whatever (laughs) but when you're when you're not that i not that i want people to think that about me but you know that that type of humor i find absolutely captivating and that's the type of humor that i'd like to translate to other people you know like um like fuck horrific fucking stories from my childhood and shit like that they're like Something, yeah, real. A lot of them are real, but uh, you know, like, where is the line between, like, I know what's real and I know what's dark about it, but it, it may be subversive in 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 an yeah. audience situation, you know. And I, yeah. I enjoy that type of shit. But um, that's not that's not at all like my only focus. Like, I, I uh, learned how to play the guitar in the last uh, oh. since I stopped drinking. Um, like, I probably spent six months or whatever, and then decided to start exercising my brain again. So I learned how to play the guitar. Which is something I've always wanted to do. Um, I'm not very good, but I can play it, which is fucking sick. I get to play some, like some of my play and sing some of my favorite songs, which is like so much fun to be able to do that on your own to make yeah. your own fucking music is sick. Like I used to be able to do that, but like I used to play the flute, right? Fucking, you not get any pussy playing the flute, right? I don't know, man. <laughs> yeah, I know some not. pretty hot ladies who play the flute. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe those ladies are out getting pussy playing the flute, but I fucking never get any <laughs> pussy playing the flute. You Matt Holmes, the flute right? With them. <laughs> Flute, <laughs> flute, do duet, duet, flute. The flute, do duet. <laughs> oh, I'm fucking um, learning how to thrash the axe, play some Bob Dylan, and That's who right. knows, get some ladies swoon and come yeah. over and have a cry with me. And we'll Are we going to see a um, a revamp of the uh, the TV anchor, the TV host? Oh, I fucking love to do more of that shit, man. Like I, I find that stuff just so much fun. Um, <laughs> like it's fun to be around people that do that kind of shit because it's so high stress and all the rest of it and yeah I, I enjoyed that I very much enjoy fucking I'm a mad narcissist as well so I love fucking being <laughs> center of attention man like, it's fucking, a microphone. Yeah, it's like it's, yeah that's right I was sat in front of a fucking massive microphone with lights <laughs> in my face and shit like you know I drove out of, like two hours out of my way I'm gonna be late home and all the rest of it I'm fucking loving this shit I'm like <laughs> let's talk some more fellas you know well you sort of haphazardly kind of fell into being the dude with the microphone at jams and stuff like early on yeah halloween jams at dullet chill or five doc jams and Thanks, stuff like abs. that you, yeah well, yeah somehow you you just ended up it's like oh we've got the microphone hand it hand it over to zave and we'll, he'll get everyone abs was doing a laughing. shit job abs was doing a <laughs> fucking shit job <laughs> no it was like 
All right, it was like fucking late in the day. Um, somebody was talking about whipping the crowd into a frenzy so that somebody <laughs> could do some fucking stupid shit, you know? And like Abs was trying his fucking best, getting nothing out of anybody. And it was kind of like the old tried and true Australian commentary method, you know, where it's like a big old tail whip and a bit. This is not to trash Abs, but to trash the. The fucking spinal disorder commentators it's and stuff a, like that. The, the it's model, BMX race, isn't the it? model, the model that we're yeah, used to. Yeah, where it's like no, nothing exciting is happening unless something exciting has, is happening on the <laughs> bike. And like, I kind of thought, like, fuck that. Like, what, what's the fucking point of that? You know, like, I know every motherfucker here, everybody gets the joke. So let's go around and fucking make jokes, you know? And that's all it was, is like, I, uh, I the first I think I actually won a beer sculling contest, which is the first ever thing that happened at a jam at all. And from that, Abs gave me a um, beer coaster or whatever. Let me say something in the microphone. I said it, and it got a bunch of yucks. And then um, <laughs> yucks, <laughs> yeah, a bunch of yucks. And uh, and then uh, yeah, it was like the, the next. <clears throat> A little bit later on, like 20 minutes later or something like that, that's when they were trying to like get the crowd going or something. And then I think Abs gave it to me. He couldn't He couldn't be fucked anymore. It wasn't that he was doing a bad job and I wanted to take over or something. He couldn't be fucked anymore or whatever it was. He was over it, wanted to ride. And so he decided like, you just fucking do it. You do whatever it is you wanted to do. And I was keen to get on there. Again, I'm a fucking narcissist. You get to hear my own voice fucking blaring at me through speakers, man. Like I'm all over that shit, like a rash. I think BMX has definitely took to your brand of humor and then just, I don't know, it just, it just became like a given. It was like, we're going to go to this yeah, jam, Zave's going to have a microphone and it's <laughs> going to be fantastic. You yeah, know, like, I did a lot of fucking different jams around, a lot of different jams actually. Yep. Actually, John, I owe, fucking owe you money. <laughs> Do you remember when, <laughs> this is going to say, oh, this is going to make me sound like such a scumbag. When I was living in Newtown and we did... The, one of the Halloween jams, I think, and they were starting to get pretty big time. And you were like, yep. you said to me, hey, I'll give you fucking, I'll pay you to come and commentate the day because we've got sponsors and shit. And I was like, fuck yeah. I, like I was doing it for free anyway. So of course I'll do it for money. Well, fuck not. That's great. It was like 170 bucks or something. And um, we turn up on the day and the generator's fucked. The, uh, <laughs> that, yeah, remember that one? The generator's totally fucked. Uh, and so somebody's got to go scramble and go and hire another generator and so of course the money that were the money that had been put set aside for me i suppose um was used on used on buying another generator fair enough totally understand that and all that sort of shit i was living in newtown at the time didn't have an income or anything like Short that newtown days yeah man i lived in the fucking flat for like seven minutes fucking seven minutes right <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had seven minutes and then i was out just slightly longer than the english guys um and then uh I actually called John Young, who had promised me the, to pay, promised me money for the thing, and actually had to be like, "Hey, so have you got that money for me now?" No, actually, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I fuck, I've always planned on paying you back for that because um, no, I was fucking fuck that man. No, it wasn't. It wasn't fucking <laughs> mine. But fuck, I was poor, dude. I, I had nothing and no one, and I was in. A, yeah, I just totaled my car and ruined another relationship. That's right. Actually, ruined two relationships, totaled my fucking car and all this shit. And um, yeah, I wasn't wasn't in a good spot again. But that's just me finding yet another rock bottom, my friend. So, 170 bucks coming your way at some point soon. <laughs> ah, that's all right. No, it's coming. <laughs> I'll, I'll make some coin these days. Oh yeah, I'm an arborist now. I'm not a chef anymore, so it's fucking. Are you working with Donga? No. <laughs> Fuck no. Wasn't he climbing trees, chopping trees? He's probably chopping trees. I don't think he was climbing trees. <laughs> I think he's that what he's doing both. No, him and all those boys had a gig doing trees with Dixons. Who were um a fucking pack of cunts, if you ask yeah. me. They just rolled their crane the other day. <laughs> yeah, right. One you've got your own cranes. You've got your own gig and your own your own yeah. setup? Um, yeah, I got my own like uh, business, but I contract out to um, other companies and shit yeah. like that, which is yeah, it's easier, easier money to get. Not it's not better money, but easier money in terms of like I leave the job and I get to go home, and shit yeah. like that. Unless when I got to fucking drive to Campbelltown and do fucking podcasts for you motherfuckers That's all night. Right. But I'm this, happy to do it. This is the big time. <laughs> yeah, this is the fucking big time. Actually, bright lights, man. Like this is crazy. <laughs> second floor. Yeah, second floor. That's oh, right. Fuck, that's yeah. right. Um, the penthouse. I guess I wanted to maybe touch on um, you being in the mountain scene, being like 
the older guy being not only an older, more experienced rider, but also you're a big figure. Like, you know, you're you're obviously you're a big human. You're a big presence at the skate park a lot of the time. People know you from the jams. They know you're the you're the funny guy in the microphone, and you're like this dude. Mm-hmm. And the Blue Mountain scene is obviously smaller than you know, and sort of removed from Sydney a little bit. You definitely may not even know it, but you have like a lot of influence over younger riders. I mean. These days you're in you're in your spot digging and stuff like that. But uh, a few years ago, maybe you know, like when Katoomba got its, its little revamp mm-hmm. in the park, you know, like, and I would get, and you know, this is also obviously, you know, showing you're credited as you know worthy of being a sponsored rider for a brand like S and M. I had kids who were from the lower mountains, thirteen year old little kids coming into the shop in Newtown and wanting to buy fucking perfect ten bars. And they're tiny little no kids. No shit. And like, Zave's got Perfect Tens on his bike. No shit. And I sold like two or three sets of Perfect Tens to kids that were way too small. Fucking hell. And I don't know, it's, it's pr- I think that's pretty amazing. Are you amazing. fucking hearing this, Chris Muller? <laughs> <laughs> fucking hell, man. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's you know, and that's the power of, you know. Of yeah, I was totally people. unaware of shit like that. Yeah, I, I mean, and, and, and you've influenced people, you know, more than just your local scene, you know what I mean? So I always just thought, that, like, I always just see those people as like my friends more than like I, I never thought that like it would turn into like kind of, you know an influencing thing or something like I know that's I understand that that's the fucking trickle down effect of being sponsored that's the idea behind it yes behind it, yeah. um, I, and I, I'm a willing participant in that you know like I've gone and I've done like a yeah I've done shit for S&M that's like actually done for S&M kind of thing but like yeah riding at the park and the, and the character that I suppose I am at the park or used to be at the park um, was yeah it was just just being natural, just fucking around with people and shit like that, you know? And and it always got rowdy, it always got loud, but that was because of the guys that you're riding with, the guys you're bouncing off, you know? We don't have a scene in the upper mountains now outside of, you know, myself and Al and um, Pato, really. There's, like, there are some guys, but they, you know, they float about or whatever, they're, you know, they're, no one's really connected or anything like that. So um, there's, like, two or three of us, like, a, yeah. and me and Al dig, you know? so our time spent out there like I yeah I guess yeah fuck man like that's crazy it's it's different now though like all this shit's fucked up because if you're not willing to play the Instagram game how the fuck are you meant to do that like influence people or get bars sold or fucking get someone to buy a frame or whatever you know like go to the skate park and like there's literally no bike riders in Katoomba except people used to get sponsored before Instagram I know, I did. I fucking didn't have any social media when I got sponsored. Thank you very much, Matthew Holmes. I was um, legit, I remember mate. those days. I remember yeah. those days too, back in the day. But no, like the, it's, it's now it's like you've got to fucking, you, you're either doing something or you're putting it on an Instagram or whatever. I find far more value in digging my jumps. Yeah. Like that to, that to me is like, fuck building a fucking Instagram profile when I can build a down ramp. You know what I mean? Like when I can build I a- I reckon if you've got sorry, enough landing, phones James and Brooks. put them, it'd look like those kickers you had in the interview. Which ones? All those iPhone 10s all stacked up. You can make a good training. On the, what are you talking about? Just laying phones on. <laughs> well, at the, at the Thrash for Cash. Where they tell you. Thrash for Cash at Emu Plains range. You had a bunch of screens in yeah. that down ramp or back of the lip or whatever. It looked fucking. Is that where you boosted to the sky and launched off the bike? Uh, was no, that, that, was the, that was the year before. Boot it out of the, the drain. The, the, the spine thing where I did yeah. the 360. Yeah. That's that where you became, the, you became a meme. First year. Yeah, that was that actually. You that's became true. a black and white meme. I did become a meme. Be, bailing off. Did three. Jay Wilson jump that as well in a big one foot X? That was two years later. That was two yeah, years that was later. A different Probably setup. my favourite photo on the mag ever. Good photo. So we, did, we had three jams there. I, fun, I wasn't man. super involved in um, organising the first one, although I did help out the last minute. But that was basically Alex and Nick Edwards because they were on Nick like Edwards. a pretty productive path together at that yeah. stage, pushing Marshall clothing pretty hard and shit. Um, Alex was making some fucking headway. You know, in in terms of his metal, yeah, career or, or whatever the fuck you want to call it, um, and then yeah, he's done MTV Scarred by then. Uh I don't fucking know <laughs> actually. Timeline, yeah, I have no maybe. idea. I'm pretty sure he, I'm pretty sure he crashed already by then. Yeah. But I, no, he fucking had. He fucked yeah. himself up already. But I, I don't know if MTV had come out or whatever. <laughs> oh, shit. But um, <laughs> no, he was productive at that point. Like he was being real productive and shit, getting shit done. He put that jam on with those dudes and they built that crazy spine. It was just fucking calling, calling for that. 
fucking three. Super boost. Yeah. yeah a fucking, I know that that was filmed by um, John Young and Abs, and those clips have never seen the light of day. Are you serious? Can we cut them into this? If you can find fucking them. Fucking find them, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then I guess the, the year, the, the second, the Thrash for Cash, the second one, where you just yeah. had that big wooden king, it was a big set of doubles. That and was you, like the... You three, that, and that was pretty, that was pretty 30 awesome. Foot, that was a 30-foot-plus jump. That was fucking yeah. massive with not much running. And um, Gare- Luke Garecki double-whipped it. That's Ooh, right. That was he also front-wheel head-tube cased it somehow. <laughs> he did, hey. It was the most perfect double-whip we've ever seen and then just ploughed the head-tube yeah, to yeah, the top yeah. of the landing. <laughs> ben Halpin got fucking roasted doing a, uh, a tail-whip on it, a single tail-whip. Which was loose because it was like Taj style, like real, real long in here. Yes, off his didn't bike get stuck. Ages. Yeah, the whip just stopped on him, and he fucking ended up taking a shark bite out. We had there's some cool shit at that jam. Yeah, and you, your jam. influence. I mean, you you managed to convince kids. That's right. To for donate, for to for donate. a terrible Eastern frame. You were shaking at them to do the best do the salmon, salmon <laughs> bail, and these kids who are probably all adults now, <laughs> fucking sprinting at this horrifically terrifying you know like eight foot wooden kicker with a 30 foot gap <laughs> just they have no there. chance yeah. in fucking hell of clearing and they're just <laughs> sprinting at it and just jumping off and pretending they're a bloody yeah. fish out of water that and just was plowing into the back of landing and you're shaking a frame saying that wasn't good enough uh, fucking go again that kids. Was so <laughs> fucking <laughs> <laughs> a lot of pushing, a lot of pushing kids. And man. people like, do what you said because you're, you're Zave and you have the oh, microphone. I so live live was there as well, man. Well, like, Al, yeah. Me and Alex peer pressure and somebody to do something is pretty hard to say no, I think. Well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> we need to start a petition to get you commentating the Olympics. Get me commentating the fucking Vans comp. The Olympics. I make Daryl now look like a. Look, oh, look amazing. He looks amazing every time he does those wear contests. Happy I can't pants? say anything about you're his gonna image. Are you going to wear happy amazing. pants? I, well, if, that, if that's what it fucking takes, man, I'll even wear Vans to the Vans thing if that's what it takes. <laughs> we'll get so danger to tie-dye I actually do have you. a pair of Vans for walking in. Yeah? Yeah. I don't ride in that shit. Just, just for Vans walking. Vans are made for walking. They are for, made, made for walking. They're not made do. for riding bikes in, unfortunately. The problem is if you go on... It if might you become, be. a, a, you know, if you go on screen, if you're a commentator at the Vans comp and mm. you're um, behind the microphone of everyone, everyone's going to mistake you because you you have... You're a lookalike for about seven different celebrities. Yeah, there's a few of us. Yeah, you, you know, you're, you're Seth Century, you're yeah. fucking Ashton Kutcher, you're Josh Hartnett. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's like, doesn't Zave look like that guy? There's a um, whole bunch of us, man. There's probably fucking 50 or 60 of me getting around that, or, that look like all of those dudes. It's so weird. Every now and then <laughs> I bump into one of us and I'm just like, fuck, that cunt looks like me. Yeah. Like, and he's looking at me just like, fucking who the fuck is that guy? Like, Who's that handsome motherfucker over there? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. He's adorable. <laughs> oh, and I was talking to Sean Gardner today in the shop and he, I started showing him some old footage of you and stuff and he's like, that's the one where he looks like fucking Seth Sentry. <laughs> Fuck yeah. <laughs> yeah, it'd be fun, fun to dig up those uh, that old edit I made with Ben. Liv put that edit together, the one that was on Hindsight 3. Yeah. That was a fucking red hot edit too. Well, I've got it then. Somewhere. Whack it up. It's better than anything I've done in the last 10 years, man. <laughs> I need some fucking footy up there. John, you've been holding those clips for too long. You got the five You got the five dock bowl clip, those two, three, six Ooh. Well, the five dock bowl clip, the photo of that's in your 2020 interview, mm. yeah. which is, I mean... Gorman took the photo from the wrong side. He admits that. Still pretty rad. <laughs> five, five dock's a hard place to shoot. It is. The, the clip... Um, the clip from that little tripod camera you set up, I remember that being fucking unbelievable. It's like fish, shot fish down from just inside the high side of the pocket. Yeah. The way it comes around looks so legit. And I was just like, that's it. Hang the bike up. That's the best thing yeah. you're ever going to do. You don't need to top that. Um, and then, um, yeah, who knows? Well, what's next in BMX for you? <laughs> Keep digging, man. I, Keep like, digging. I love digging. Like, I, I, yeah, I'm riding like faster and jumping bigger jumps and going to higher and stuff like that than I ever have in my entire life and it's like brand new it's brand new and I'm digging it and I'm, like I'm digging it literally for myself and uh, it's like yeah that's that's BMX for me now like I have no desire to to fucking I don't know do anything except that except faster, dig and higher. Di- yeah just dig yeah. just dig a line that's just amazing from start to finish perfect that has that yeah I know the feeling that I'm looking for and when I get there, then I'll let you know. But it's fuck. It's just around the corner, you know. It's 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 so much fun. Like 
that's all I want to do is dig and ride. I don't want to. I don't want to go to the skate park and spend time trying to fucking land tail whips anymore. No. I want to spend that time digging, and then when I get that run through, it's all worth it. You know, I don't. I don't want to. Yeah, I don't need tail whips, and I don't need fucking tricks and stuff like that any, anymore. You know, I'm, I'm certainly not like. No, into the whole um, like the the bowl craze that's kind of taken over or whatever is to me is like a form of I don't know just like pussy footing around the fact that it's like you just want to ride jumps yeah so just fucking build jumps you know like yeah. like I get going to the bowl I get guys that do that it's fucking you don't now have to it's, work on it well yeah exactly it's financially feasible it's time uh, manageable you don't have to build the fucking thing on your own unless you fucking Clint Reynolds or something but you know what I mean like. Yeah. you can spend time riding your bike doing that yeah you can I'd just rather have like one day just have the perfect line and that's why I've got this spot there where it is with the guys that it's with um, out in the fucking bush no kid is riding out there from the train station you know what I mean like that no one's getting out there unless they fucking know where they are yeah. no scooters either no fucking scooters either Tom not one fucking for as far as you can see yeah. and um you can see pretty far but it's just that's all I, that's all i want from it like just doing that you know the, yeah riding for s and is fucking amazing i'd like for that not to stop as well it's pretty fucking incredible um but yeah if i can if i'm able to give back to them in some way like in some way even if it's a rock and table on a real big jump and the photo's really well taken by a great photographer and it looks good that to me is is so fucking so much more important than like gram clips after gram clips yep. after gram clips and that, that's but that's just you know that's what that'll probably get me kicked off the team because that i'm changed, unproductive has, has that changed i mean I, I heard it from so many people 2020 stopped and so many crew are like well what are, what do i aim for now that yeah what, I can't what are we get working cover, towards that i can't yeah. i'm not working towards yeah, a spread in the mag, an interview. Or, it's very know. much like that. You know, if I just have to go out and get clips, mm. is it worth doing? Like, I, I think it is. Like, going out and filming, yeah, I don't know. Man. No, but is it just worth doing it for throwaway clips, flicking through a phone? Oh, is it worth riding a bike? For Instagram. No, for, no, no, no. Riding, no, riding a bike becomes for, for Instagram. No, but I mean... I'd still be doing the shit I'm doing if I didn't have Instagram. Yeah, but is it worth just putting all the stuff on Instagram? Oh, I don't put all the stuff on Instagram. I put fuck all on Instagram. Hmm. Like for the amount I'm out there um, digging, trying to squeeze minutes. Out, like I'm, when, when I was crapping on about inspirational shit before, I'm talking about fucking fit, milking every day for every fucking minute. And yeah, that means savings is a special time too, isn't well, it? Well, yeah, man. Like shit like that. You spend that time. I spend a lot of the summer time with my, um, with my daughter but because um, I'm still getting to know her. She's, I've only known her for two years or whatever. But And the jumps will be there. They're fine. And if they get bulldozed, there's plenty more bush. I'll go and start another project. You know, like That's how, the way that I look at it now. Is like, as long as it keeps going, it's a fucking good thing, right? And if it gets bulldozed, so what? It was going to get bulldozed anyway. It doesn't matter if it happens now or 10 years down the track. I'm just going to start digging another spot. Just keep that. I don't reckon you're getting bulldozed, man. I can't get a bulldozer between the trees. <laughs> yeah, go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the only way they can bulldoze it by knocking Take down the trees. trees down. That's, that's how stubborn the Blue Mountains Council is, though. They'll fucking do that, man. They'll, I know, they'll, but, you, but, but mm. that's where you'll be in check with some crew who'll go, you can't knock the trees down. That's true. And you I've know, got like, a few I've got a few of those blokes on side. But yeah, no, that's pretty much like, Man, I'm, uh, I'm kind of doing it. Like, I, I always wanted to have something that I could say, like, yeah, these jumps are fucking legit. They're big. They're fast. They work. They're well manicured. They're smooth. They, You know, all that type of shit. That's the kind of shit, I guess, a lot of guys... It looks like a theme park ride, man. It kind of feels like that. And it's a, it's the shit that a lot of guys fucking spend so much time and energy creating an image around that they do that, you know? Like... Yeah. Dudes that turn up to the fucking turn up to a bowl with like fucking their socks pulled up and all the right looking shit, you know what I mean? Like they're dressed like they're fucking just come out the of the Austin Woods or something, <laughs> and it's like, can you don't you don't even do it for real? But you know what I mean? Like, and I guess I always want it. Like I just I've always wanted to do it for real, so I did. I just have didn't done it for real. I think you've done it for real for the whole time I've known you. Well, I tried to, I guess, like as I much as just possible, just tried to be honest with myself and honest with fucking particularly with like how I, re how I represent S&M, like just honest and straight up with that shit. 
you can't fucking have the image of a guy that has great jumps or whatever, or the image of a trails dude or something like that if you're roaching another dude's spot. Or you can't have fucking... great jumps unless you build great jumps. Exactly, right? You, they're not going to exist if you sit there going, well, fucking how high do I need to pull my socks today to look like I fucking rode trails Is that a or thing? Something? I thought that was just a road bike like I dudes that I had sock height. What, I think people pull their socks up. Is that a thing? Like they're a part yeah, of something. Socks are up these days. Fuck. But I don't fucking know. What man. has BMX become? I don't know. When was it? <laughs> well, if I BMX wear shorts, my BMX socks are up sick. a little like, bit because uh, my, I don't like how white my legs are. Mostly. Are they the shin pads? Oh, I pull my socks up too sometimes. Sometimes I go out there in ankle socks. It doesn't really phase me, but I'm not going. Yeah, I don't know, man. It's just weird when people rap so much. They're, they're desperate for the image rather than actually doing it. The if they reality. put as much time and effort into doing it, going and digging rather than collecting the imagery shit that they need to look the part, they'd fucking have it and then they would be the part. I mean, something know? I always thought about with magazines when I was a kid, you know, and when I started the mag, when I was running a mag, was like, I remember a couple of times I'd open a mag when I was young and you'd always see the thing, you know, the dude that you thought was cool. Mm. Oh, that dude in the car was cool and he's got a sticker on his head tube there and he's got a sticker on the down tube there and his shorts there and maybe he had his socks up to a certain height. I can't mm. remember the socks. But if you read an interview with him or they had something to say and maybe they said something fucking profound and then you suddenly realize that it wasn't about the fucking socks. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure, they shredded, but they had something more going on. Yeah, maybe they dug the trails, maybe, you know, maybe they were like Taj and said, oh, he's a vegan or, you know, there was, there was a bigger picture to this dude who could ride good because I don't <laughs> think there's ever been a shortage in Australia, especially the fucking bullshit good riders. Yeah, yeah, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but it's always been a bit more about the story behind them that mm -hmm. made them a good person, you know, beyond just being able to do trick X. Yeah, yeah. Or style Y. I know what you mean. Mm -hmm. What do you what what do you mean about the the socks thing that there's more to it than the pulled up <laughs> um, socks? Like, well, I'm just saying uh, the image that you see. I'm not we're getting hung up on the socks. I'm, not, I'm stuck minute. on the socks. I'm, thing. I'm like, saying, what's the fucking metaphor? I don't the understand image that's it. portrayed if it's on Instagram or in a magazine or in a video yeah, yeah. or whatever, any old school media you can think of. But like, there is more to it than just that image that's portrayed, and that's you building the jumps and making that scene happen. That's what I'm saying. There's a bigger picture to it than just that little image of what's shown yeah well yeah. that no yeah, that's that's what that, I, I think that i think i know what you're talking about like when you see a picture of a of a scene it's not just the ingredients within the picture that make that up it's is that lot, what you mean like it's more. it's there's obvious that it. yeah exactly yeah. it's not just like yeah it's not and just it's not easy to get it's not that easy to get either you can't just go buy that no yeah, yeah you fucking can't go and buy it fucking yeah you can't fucking buy that shit it's just <laughs> you have to fucking want it but yep. you got to make a decision that you want it and then just fucking go and do it go work fucking nice you go work yeah but yeah that's the fucking that's a joy in it you fucking work till it hurts and that's when you make stuff happen yeah i guess so like uh, yeah Fuck it, you guys invited me on this shit and I haven't done a fucking, I haven't lifted a fucking finger in fucking so long for the BMX community. <laughs> Apart from and you guys fucking fucking, trails. You guys, well, I mean, that's selfish though. Like I ride those, I get to ride those jumps. Al hasn't even got to hit the hip down the bottom yet because <laughs> the poor guy came up short on one of the long jumps and jacked his ankle the other week. And it's like, I got to ride the hip, you know? I posted that clip on, I love that shit. And then it's like, I feel so bad for that dude. I haven't done fuck all for BMX. <laughs> I just want to ride these fucking jumps, you know, like, and I want you dudes to come and hang out and stuff like that. But that's but. why you ride BMX in the first place. You're not part of a team. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's and, true. I want to ride and, and, my and, and I want you guys people like us have gotten stoked from seeing the progress of your spot and seeing, seeing you so stoked on your spot yeah. gets us stoked that's and sick. makes me happy that you're fucking doing this and you're really you're enjoying your time there and it's just like it's really good to see and like in in turn that's gi you giving back because you're oh, making me happy because i see that and i'm like fucking right on dude like this is and he's doing it and well that's an easy way to to, to do it man so like if you're gonna let me off the hook like that that's, that's fucking easy well, i'll, I'll mean, give like, back like that <laughs> yeah I mean, you know, I mean yeah it's it's not i wouldn't view it as selfish whatsoever you know so it's I mean, yeah, I, like everyone's welcome to come and have a ride for the most part. It, like if you don't know the avenues to go down to ha come and have a ride, well then that's when you know that you're probably not going <laughs> to, you know what I mean? Like if you don't know how to go about th that, then yeah, you, you're probably not welcome. 
for everyone else, man. Like, yeah, I want I want people to come and ride the jumps. Like, there's no point just having fucking jumps where you just lock the place up and say, if you don't dig here for 90 fucking hours or something, you can all go fuck yourselves and all the rest of it. Like, I've heard there's places that are unbelievably strict about. You well, know, they exist for sure. Yeah, like who who comes when when who's digging all that type of thing, and it's like. Fuck that shit, man. Like, I still want the same type of attitude that we had when we had the jumps at Hughes Avenue down the bottom of the fucking street at Lawson when I was 10, digging with Andrew Beeman and Steve Brown. Like, just wanting to have jumps for the sake of it, wanting to go fast and high and shit like that and wanting to share that feeling with my fucking mates. That's all it is. Like, I love that shit about BMX and it's yeah, t- it took a lot of confusion and confuddlement over the last 10 years to... um sort of arrive at that really happy destination where I'm at now, you know, like, and, and looking forward to moving into a more mature, um, riding life through my thirties, you know, like, I yes, I never, ever counted on, on making it this far, dude at all, <laughs> at fucking all, man. I never yeah. thought I would even like live this fucking long, let alone have shit, like have support from people in any way, I'm shape, or form. I'm stoked to see you make it this far, man. Dude, I'm so psyched. Like, I, and I can't fucking wait for what's next. That's that's the fucking, that's the kicker, you know. And it's all it's it, to me, it's all fucking doable, failure or not. I'm fucking doing it. Like, I don't care if I fucking fail. That's who gives a shit about fucking failing. That's what teaches. You know what I mean? Like, when you fucking go to jail and you fucking have somebody like staring in your asshole and shit like that to make sure you don't smuggle and drugs in there, it takes a lot of ego away from you turns you into it makes you yeah appreciate the worst possible things because it's not that you know what i mean like it's not fucking getting treated like an animal and all that type of shit it's very very like poignant annoying horrific things that happen to you in your day-to-day life that you would just find so fucking frustrating that are just like fine just so perfect you know or enjoyable compared to like how some people have it like some of these cunts live fucking 10 years in that place man like fuck that shit i dipped my toe in a fucking pool and got to decide whether or not to jump in you know and i didn't jump in I fucking knock on near that pool ever again you know what i mean and you I got stuff to build man appreciate Definitely. every fucking day that it's not anything like that because there's guys in there that there's no fucking way they're ever going to get out you know what i mean they're never going to get out of the cycle they're never going to get out of the fucking the whole thing I just love shit, man. I love it now and I look forward to it and I just fucking like, fucking bring it on. You know, the more shit you can, I don't care what the fuck it is, good or bad, fucking bring it my way because I'll fucking deal with it. Fuck yeah, dude. I love the shit. Well, I mean, Matt and myself included, I guess like we are stoked that you have, you know, you're out sort of the other side of a lot of this sort of stuff and you've found, you're at a point where you are able to just stand up and say, I love this shit. I'm doing what I'm doing and we couldn't be more stoked that you came on here with us and also that you're doing it and you're having fun and we enjoy you know we we enjoy seeing you stoked and you're digging jumps you're doing your thing and it's the fucking best man and I don't know I guess probably I know it's probably almost time to sort of start wrapping this yeah. this whole thing up. I mean, yeah, I'm gonna get home to my kid and be up for work in four hours. So. <laughs> I'd love yeah. to do this again one time, man. Yeah, that's yeah. I think that's, there's more tales to be told. We got, we, we got plenty. <laughs> well, that's the thing. <laughs> yeah. is so much shit. Like, yeah, fuck. We could talk about my mum all night. Nah, I don't have any mum issues. That's fucking. I'm kidding. Thanks, <laughs> right. Thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, man. dude. No. Yeah, and is there anyone you want to kind of just shout out to, give a thanks to for you know in your BMX sort of journey i mean obviously. yeah absolutely like obviously obviously alex live is uh, just the greatest confidant and friend of mine um he yeah we've been through thick and thin together and he knows probably more about me than i know about myself i guess um at times you know like he, he's such a dude and he's cre- he's opened so many doors for me and created so many connections for me um in terms of that like you know professional level of bmx or whatever the fuck that world of sponsorship and all that shit like he he's he took care of a lot of those connections for me and like yeah showed me a lot of shit chris smith taught me how to fucking dig jumps you know like my cousins mark and roger they taught me what a bike should look like from a young age you know like how these things should be set up the why they look tough what is it about them that looks tough and shit like that um yeah chris smith teaching me how to fucking dig how to ride 
Newland showing me how to dig, how to dig fucking jumps, how to be strict and how to be unapologetic <laughs> about it. He's, he's um, the godfather of trails in Australia, probably. Exactly. You know, in, in and owning the fact, like, the, for, on the but when that on was the happening, Coast. when that was happening in the fucking late nineties, man, like that was a time when there was no fucking like, that was a fucking hard time to be alive because there was a lot of angst like a lot of teenage angst and all that kind of shit and nobody was fucking connected via the internet nobody was sharing any stories kids were getting fucking bullied and, rah, rah, and all that type of shit and he was like so fucking down the line with he was just absolutely rigid in the way that he behaved with the care that he took in in overlooking the jumps and shit like that and like that level of strictness and that approach is yeah fucking like I've, I've never had a father by the way so Glenn Yulin is almost like a dad. No, he's not. <laughs> he's probably the most positive male role model I've ever had in my life. You know, at any kind of young age, I was like, wow, that guy's pretty strict on himself. That's probably a good way to live your life. You know, that was the closest I've ever had to a, some, to, you know, seeing a man doing the right thing, I suppose, in, in fucking life. Um, and oddly, like, I, there's no fucking way Glenn knows that <laughs> at <laughs> all. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, like outside outside of those dudes, obviously you guys, obviously Matt Holmes and, and you Tom, um, uh, you taking me on at the shop and fucking you, you gave me those. I still have those wheels that you gave me and built me up fucking like n- nearly ten years ago now. <laughs> nearly ten years, wow. Um, there's still no, it's not quite that long, but it's like six and a half, seven years or something like that. It's a long fucking time. Um, you Holmes, man, like you ran pictures of me in the magazine. You let me write a column for the magazine, and yep. I and I fucking cockily told you, don't edit my shit. <laughs> I said, don't edit it or don't run it. I know no, you did. You didn't edit it, so thank you, man. Like that, that I could not fucking believe. <laughs> I could not fucking believe uh, being so cocky that I would say something like that to you. But um, yeah, thank you for being so understanding of, of I guess the the cockiness or brashness that you probably have to have to try and push out of the Blue Mountains and into a into yeah. a pretty established scene. I understand um, that coming from a small place as well. And and yeah, fully, man. Like it's it's the same shit. You know, you're like, what am I in for? Yeah, what's this gonna be about? Yeah. And and John Young, massively like uh, one thing I wanna wanna I definitely want to say about like the early videos, particularly um like the early Hall- early Halloween jams and stuff like that and like the Irvine interviews and, and all that type of shit is like I was just as much of a fucking doofus as Irvine. Like in every <laughs> fucking regard, right? Like in every way, I was just as much of a fucking dickhead. John edited things to make me look like some kind of... Like I got the upper hand somehow mentally or whatever the fuck it was. And, you know, the the way that John has put me into his videos throughout the years has been so incredibly flattering and, and somehow a beautiful kind of manipulation of the truth, I suppose. <laughs> Um, that it's like it's like not got me kicked off teams and fucking you know not had me ostracized from from the BMX community and it you know my behavior very well could have and you know currently is like there's still people that fucking hate me for shit that I did years ago that I've apologized for fucking a thousand times that you know through their need of um, retribution or something like that they can't let go of it and that's okay um I, I apologize to those people as well but yeah thanks so much to to john for always painting me up in in such a positive light it's really uh it really is something that like i, I don't mean to do or anything and and yeah you've always been so kind to me with the camera and the editing man so like i, I appreciate that massively because you you've the only person that's ever shown any myself to the world or anything or, or the internet or anything like that um, and you were very kind in the way that you did that. So thank you very much. And um, yeah, thank you guys again for having me on here. It's been Thanks an absolute on, fucking man. pleasure. And Anytime. I really, really hope you guys can come up to the jumps sometime. We'll yeah. have a ride and I'll get a flatland patch done, dug out for you. I'm not going to come in case you're at jumps. <laughs> I'm kidding. No, you are not. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck yeah. I appreciate thank you, it, man. Brad. Is that it? it? Is that it? Thanks, man. That was awesome, man. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> How long was that? <laughs>